Good evening and welcome to the 7.30 meeting, regular meeting of Lynchburg City Council for today, November 12th. Please stand for invocation by Council Member Wilder, followed by the Pledge of Allegiance. That was about heads. Heavenly Father, we thank you for the Lynchburg City Council. We thank you for all the members, all the staff workers, all the citizens of Lynchburg. We thank you for the work that we're doing on our council to make this a better place to live, work, and play. Continue to give us the guidance and the wisdom to make the right decisions that, you, that your city will flourish, that our citizens will flourish, that our poverty will be reduced, that we reduce crime, and, and we pray for our police department, our, our, our life-saving crew, and the firemen. We pray, pray protection over their lives and bless their families and bless the hard workers in our city. Continue to give us that guidance and wisdom. In your precious name we pray, amen. Thank you very much. And this evening we have a number of recognitions that I am going to go through. And um, I would ask Vice Mayor, would you like to come down with me and we begin to go through these? Yeah. Thank you very much. Ah, and here we go. First of our recognitions this evening is the Heritage High School Girls Track and Field State Championship 2019 Spring Champions. Is that anyone in the house like that? Yay, okay. <laughs> Thank you. I believe we have here Coach Sean Webb. Coach Webb? And these young ladies achieve this. Come across here. Yep, you come across the front. <laughs> Coach Webb, I want to make sure. Is it Coach Webb? Coach Sean Webb? Okay, come on. I know you have some other staff members that I'm very familiar with. So first, we want to say congratulations. You've gotten the applause, but we're going to do it again. How about that? All right, everybody give them a round of applause. And I'm going to read this. Each one will receive a certificate of excellence presented to, and in this case, it's Grayson Arnold, member of the Heritage High School 2019 Outdoor Track and Field State Team and winner of the 2019 Virginia 3A Girls Outdoor Track and Field State Championship. Presented to you today, November 12th, 2019, Mayor Trinae L. Tweedy, Mayor, and we are so proud of you. So I want to say thank you. Um, our high school teams rock in, in everything they do. And so the fact that you all are great um, off the track in your academics and your personal pursuits, your community activism, your volunteerism, as well as being tremendous athletes, we are very proud of you. And so I'm going to turn to Mr. Webb to say a few words about you because your coaches know you very personally and uh, they may want to kind of speak some proud moments for you. Well, I'm not technically the guy in charge. Uh, I'm just oh, I'm, a, I'm an assistant, you know. Okay. <laughs> he he, he, defer, he defers to me to talk for him, but I'm gonna allow him to have this stage. Please do. So we this is head sure. coach Donald Alexander. Okay. First of all, I'd like to uh, thank City Council for inviting us down. Mm -hmm. They recognize us. 
This is a great group of kids. I don't have any problems with them. Um, when I took over as head coach, our grade point average wasn't what we would desire. But as of right now, our cumulative grade point average is well over 3.0. Some of the most athletic and the most the smartest kids at the school. Um, we have Lasia Oaks, who is was oh. <laughs> she was all area athlete of the year. I forget. See, this is when you should have kept Coach Webb up because he's at my numbers man. He'll tell you how many points she scored at the state meet, but she was half points for us at the state meet. Thirty-one and a half points by herself. Oh, very good. Congratulations. Yes, our girls came through. After the first day, I was feeling a little anxious, but uh -huh. on the second day, when our girl, my long jump girls came through, got first, second, and third. And a lot of the kids were placed, I mean, were ranked uh, probably fifth, sixth, seventh, eighth out of the points, but they all came through. You know, the, the three, three jumpers, uh, shot putter, Grayson Arnold. Mm -hmm. Wasn't even ranked to score. She came through and scored for me. After after Grayson scored, I felt better. Right. <laughs> Very good. But uh, that's about all I want to say. You want to say anything, Coach Webb? Yeah. Would you like to introduce your coaching staff? Okay. So uh, this is uh, Coach Ricky Callaway. Very good. This is uh, Coach Dwayne Morgan. This is the Reverend Coach Mrs. Jones. <laughs> Is Mr. Beatty? Oh, there we go. Thank you. We also have Dr. Edwards is here. Thank you, Mr. Beatty, Dr. Edwards, and to all of the parents. They don't do it alone. It takes practicing. It takes support. And so thank you for being here this evening, but thank you for what you do for them every day. So thank you so much. And what we're going to do, because there are a lot of them, I was signing and it kept going and going. Um, what I, I did read the certificate to you, so I would like to call each of their names to recognize them and shake their hand. I just like to do that. So Grayson Arnold. Tia Blake, thank you, correct me if I'm wrong, please. Whitney Culpepper, is she here? Okay, all right, all right, thank you. Malaysia Davis, oh, she graduated, okay. Dekayla Dillard, graduated, okay. Kayla Ford. Yes. Taylor Ford. All right. I don't know if they planned that or not, but okay. Angela Garland. Nope. Okay. Give her a hand clap. To Shay Garrett. No. Okay. And some of these, because they, uh, the championship was last semester, some have graduated. So that's what the coach is telling me right now. Moved on, okay, into better and bigger, successful things, right? Okay, but, okay. Tatiana Graham. Okay. All right. Solana Hamlet. Okay. Alexis Hastings. Okay. Jalen Hawkins. Kaylin Hawkins. I know, we got some twins. Michaela James. Okay. Victoria Johnson. Yes. Michaela Jump. Jersey Kelso. Okay. Alexis Lacey. Okay. Joanne Lindner. All right. Latanya Morris. Lakira Moss. Peyton Nolte. Okay. Alasia Oaks. Okay. 
Reagan Patterson. Okay. Alyssa Penn. Amia Poe. Amaya Poe. Amaya Poe. Thank you. You're welcome. Desiree Seward, okay. okay. Olivia Vier, and Jalen Ewell. Move away. Oh, move away. Okay, all right. The 2019 champion. That'll work. Yes. We were missing one. Mm -hmm. Okay. Thank you. Thank you, parents, everyone who's there. And as we clear out, we have the next recognition, which is the Nurse Practitioners Week proclamation. And so I would like to ask that the nurse practitioners come up, please. Thank you very much. Hello. Anyone else coming with you? All right. Well, I'd like to first say that this is the proclamation for Nurse Practitioners Week, whereas nurse practitioners or NPs are advanced practice registered nurses, APRNs, who have advanced clinical education and training, building upon their initial registered nurse preparation, and whereas NPs serve as trusted frontline providers of health care for patients in our state, and whereas there are more than 270,000 licensed nurse practitioners in the United States and more than 11,650 licensed NPs in Virginia providing primary, acute, and specialty care to patients of all ages and walks of life, and whereas NPs diagnose, treat, and prescribe medications and other treatments to patients through a caring, patient-centered, holistic model of care, and whereas citizens have great trust in the high quality care NPs provide, resulting in more than one billion patient visits annually to NPs across the country, and whereas more than five decades of research demonstrates the high quality of care provided by NPs, and whereas better utilization of NPs through modernized state laws and improved system policies creates better health through a more accessible, efficient, cost-effective, and higher quality healthcare system, 
And whereas HB 793 now allows NPs with the equivalent of five or more years of clinical experience to apply for autonomous practice licensure, thereby increasing access to patient care in the Commonwealth. Now, therefore, I, Trinae L. Trine L. Tweedy, Mayor of the City of Lynchburg, Virginia, do hereby declare November 10th through 16th, 2019, Nurse Practitioners Week in Lynchburg, recognizing the countless contributions NPs have made over the past half century and will continue to make the health and well-being of our citizens. Signed November 12, 2019, Trinae L. Tweedy, Mayor, and I will give you the opportunity to talk about your profession and brag a little bit as well. Thank you. <laughs> My name is Gabrielle Crawford. I'm a nurse practitioner with CMG Surgical Specialists. I also work with trauma services. And my name is Sarah Waddell. I'm a nurse practitioner with Neurology thank Center. Thank you very much. Yeah. Well, thank, thank you all. Thank and you. have a wonderful week. And we well deserve. Thank you, thank you so you. much. Let's give them a hand. We just have a diverse group of recognitions. Now we will have the fall 2019 co-starters graduates and economic development has brought us certificates and so we are going to recognize you as well. We are so pleased to recognize tonight the fall 2019 cohort of co-starters gra co graduates. Co-Starters is a nine-week program offered by the Office of Economic Development and Tourism that equips aspiring entrepreneurs with the insights, relationships, and tools needed to turn business ideas into action and to turn a passion into a sustainable and thriving business. This nationally-based program is designed to jumpstart entrepreneurial ideas and provide a foundation for success, all within a community of other entrepreneurs working together. This was introduced in Lynchburg in 2016. To date, 96 people have graduated from the program and many have launched new businesses in the Lynchburg community. As we call your name, please come up to receive your certificate of recognition. And I'm gonna ask everyone to continue standing so that of course, Marjette and Anna wanna take photos, so we know that. <laughs> so we will first start. Mm -hmm. Co-starters, this certifies that Stacy Allen has successfully completed the Co-starters business planning course. Stacy Allen, yay! Come on up. Thank you so much. Stand right there. All right. This certifies that Maya Booker has successfully completed the Co-starters business planning course. And I will call Kiera Height. Congratulations. Shanae Skinner. Twice in one day. Thank you. Danielle Rack. Congratulations. Kristen Prozen. Okay, not here. All right. Well, congratulations to Kristen. Yes, she deserves a hand clap as well. And Tracy Langseth. Thank you so much. Congratulations. Thank you. And I'd like to call Margette or Anna up to maybe say a few uh, words about the co-starter program. <laughs> Come on, Anna. <laughs> Thanks. We are um, so proud to offer this program, and as Tr uh, Mayor Tweedy said, we've graduated almost 100 businesses in the last four years. Um, congratulations to all of you. You've put in uh, many hours of work 
and we can't wait to see what you what you do next in the Latour business community. So thank you. Also, real quick, I want to recognize Elise Sponterelli, the executive director of Vector Space, who was our facilitator uh, for this cohort. We couldn't do this without you, Elise, so thank you. Miss Lynn Fox. Woohoo! Woo Miss Lynn Fox, please come forward. Hello. Thank you very much. Bye. Lynn Fox, Lynchburg Parks and Recreation Senior Recreation Specialist, Distinguished Service Award 2018. Lynn Fox retired from serving the senior community through Lynchburg Parks and Recreation after 43 years as of December 2018. During her time with the department, she worked in various roles from assistant supervisor to senior recreation specialist. Lynn provided quality, affordable recreational activities for several generations of adults and seniors in Lynchburg and the surrounding area. She was the first supervisor of the only designated senior center which has served as a gathering place in our community since 2004. At Templeton Senior Center, Lynn managed staff and implemented a variety of educational, enrichment, wellness, and athletic programs for adults of all ages. Using her creativity and collaborative mindset, Lynn successfully developed a number of events and ongoing programs. Lynn perfected all of the standard recreational programs such as golf outings, weekly bowling, putt-putt, senior softball, wiffle ball leagues, semi-annual dances, carnivals, health fairs, banquets, theater productions, talent shows, and open houses. I'm tired. <laughs> For 30 years, she planned and escorted monthly day trips and many overnight trips to as far as Canada and Florida. Her claim to fame is the Veterans Luncheon, an ongoing event since 1988, inspired by an area vet who simply asked, where can a vet get a free cup of coffee? <laughs> this free community event salutes men and women who have proudly served our country, offering a buffet lunch, door prizes, entertainment, and moving remarks from local veterans. Inspired by Lynchburg's James River Heritage, Lynn coordinated Down by the River Beto Day, which offered historical riverboat rides, a picnic, live music, and line dancing. Lynn also coordinated The Sky's the Limit, an event hosted at Falwell Airport, courtesy of Calvin Falwell. Activities included plane rides, a power parachute demonstration, uh, kit helicopter demos, displays of remote planes, lunch, and entertainment. You're just entertainment diversity here, right? So Lynn was an advocate for the population she served, helping to make sure that the needs of seniors in our community are met. For example, Templeton Senior Center did not always receive full funding to operate the senior transportation program. Despite partial funding through the Central Virginia Area Agency on Aging, staff and participants often had to raise funds on their own through yard sales, bake sales, and such events. In fiscal year 2018, July 17 through June 2018, Templeton Center offered 370 programs. After hitting 100% program implementation rate, Templeton Center, Center has become a role model within our recreation programming division. Lynn has proudly accepted four different awards from our Health Magazine in 2011. The Center won the Senior Entertainment Gold Award, the Senior Center Bronze Award. In 2012, Templeton upgraded to the Senior Citizen Gold Award, and in 2016, was voted for Best Senior Community Center Gold Award. 
Lynn received the highest honors in the Dale Carnegie class and was invited back as a program assistant. In 2008, she was the Catch a Star Award recipient. In 2011, Lynn was the recipient of the Beard Center on Aging Outstanding Contribution to Positive Aging. Not everyone can say that they had a job they truly love. Lynn was a dedicated city employee who established a highly respected community center and program area from the ground up that is now one of the leaders in the Lynchburg community. When asked about her professional achievements, Lynn expressed a sincere gratitude for having had a job that she loved that gave her the opportunity to work with the senior adult population who she also loves. And what I'm gonna do is say that I'm taking the time to read all of this because Lynn served our community for 43 years. So that's what I'm doing. That's what I'm doing. Thank you. have one more recognition but we're done giving awards out right now so next I have the opportunity to recognize two members of the mayor's youth council who are seated right there behind our city administration staff Annie Townsend stand up please so we can recognize you and Virginia Townsend thank you And I'm just gonna brag a little bit about you all too. So just, okay. Annie Townsend attends Easy Glass High School. She plays on the Glass Varsity Girls tennis team and enjoys spending time outdoors and being with her family. She has bunnies, chickens, and a dog, and she loves her animals. She enjoys gardening and working on projects with her family, including land clearing. That's a, okay, land clearing, all right. She feels that generational poverty is the biggest issue facing youth in the city of Lynchburg. Poverty that is passed from generation to generation is one of the biggest problems because it decreases motivation to escape poverty and makes our impoverished youth feel like they are inferior to their better half, better off classmates and friends. Also, poverty is restrictive and keeps people from accessing adequate health care and nutrition needed to lead healthy lives in order to make a change. We should focus on offering more scholarships to motivated youth that are living in poverty and reach out to them as a community. We should also create incentives for good grades at school in order to motivate success because some people are disadvantaged due to their lack of motivation. Annie volunteers at Parkview Community Mission Food Bank, Food for Thought, and she picks up litter in her neighborhood. She previously volunteered at the Greater Boston Community Food Bank, Linkhorn Middle School, and Children's Middle, Middle Miracle Network. She serves as the president of the Mayor's Youth Council as well as the secretary for the EC Glass Key Club, a volunteer organization. She has a brother and two sisters and lives on a hobby farm with her parents near the edge of Lynchburg. She enjoys studying calculus, ooh, calculus, architecture and robotics at school and enjoys hands-on activities such as building projects. She will be applying early decision to Virginia Military Institute and is interested in majoring in civil engineering. Please stand again so we can recognize you. Thank you. Thank you. Next is Virginia Townsend. She is a senior at EC Glass. She plays tennis and enjoys spending time with her family, being outdoors, running, canoeing, hiking, gardening, and caring for her dog bunnies and 25 chickens. She believes the biggest issue facing Lynchburg youth is the vaping epidemic. Teenagers vape because they think it's cool, 
but many are un unaware of consequences. A strategy that could help with this issue is raising awareness about the effects of vaping on health. She volunteers through Key Club, coordinating National Honor Society tutoring, Parkview Community Mission Food Bank, Food for Thought, and Neighborhood Litter Pickup. She enjoys playing piano as a way to relax and do something productive at the same time. She would like to major in chemistry and Spanish at VMI. Thank you. Please stand, Virginia, again. Thank you very much for attending, and uh, I hope you enjoy our meeting tonight. So thank you. they're going up while they're going up here madam clerk if you could strike the 25 chickens from the uh, record yeah. we don't want to have I any, kind of, any <laughs> kind of violation <laughs> I knew that was coming. all right thank you i think uh okay tonight's council city council agenda is divided into three sections consent agenda public hearing and general business. The first section is the consent agenda. This section includes routine items and all items may be approved by one vote. May I have a motion to approve the consent agenda? So moved. All right, thank you. The motion is moved and second. Please cast your vote. Thank you, and the motion passes seven to zero. Next is public hearings. This section includes all public hearings as required by law or as council may direct. Staff will make a presentation. Comments will then be solicited from the public and individual speaker shall have three minutes to speak. If the speaker represents a group, the speaker shall have five minutes. A speaker representing a group shall identify that group at the beginning of his or her remarks and a group may have only one spokesperson. Each speaker shall clearly state his or her name and locality of residence. Upon the conclusion of public comments on the public hearing will be closed and the matter referred to council for deliberation. Next is number 11, public hearing regarding the petition of Appalachian Power Company for a conditional use permit at the following locations. 4708 Richmond Highway, zoned B3, Community Business District, 111 Hawkham Path Road, zoned B3, Community Business District, and B3C, Community Business District, conditional. 203 Hawkham Path Road, zoned R2, low medium density, residential district, and RC conservation district. 127 Autis Lane, zoned R2, low medium density, residential district, and B3, community business district, and 280 Rockwell Road, zoned B3, community business district. The purpose of this petition is to allow for the relocation of an existing electric transmission line on these properties. The underlying zoning districts will not change as a result of this petition. And Ms. Rachel Freshheisen, Freshheisen will provide a brief summary of the request. Uh, thank you, Madam Mayor, thank Madam you. Vice Mayor, members of council. Um, as you stated, Appalachian Power Company is petitioning for this conditional use permit at several properties in the vicinity of Route US 460, Holcomb Path Road, and Rockwell Road. The purpose of the petition is to allow the relocation of an existing electrical transmission line, which would facilitate the replacement of a ne nearby vehicular bridge on US 460 by VDOT. Essentially, the, the map, there it is. Oop. Um, the transmission line currently runs here. This is the bridge and the line would be rerouted just to be a little further from that bridge. The city's technical review committee reviewed this item and there were no major issues. The planning commission recommended approval of the petition after a public hearing on their October 9th meeting. Thank you. Is there anyone to make a presentation? Good evening. My name is uh, Tom Linkus with Appalachian Power. I'm the project manager on this project. Um, I didn't really have a presentation per se. Basically what she has is what we submitted. 
um, for approval. Um, and basically here just to answer any questions. Um, our whole intent was to not move the line. Like I said, it's a lot of, lot of effort, a lot of expense, but um, working with VDOT, their construction methodology basically dictated that we had to move the line. Okay. So. All right. Well, thank you for being here, and thank you. If we have any questions, we'll call you back up. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Yes. <coughs> Is there anyone who would like to speak in favor? <coughs> Is there anyone who would like to speak in opposition? All right, there's no rebuttal needed in that case. The public hearing is closed and the matter rests with council. Yes, council member Perro. Uh, Madam Mayor, I move the resolution. Second. All right, thank you. The motion has been moved and second. Further discussion? I, I don't really have any discussion. I just have a question for mm -hmm. staff. Um, of course, we're gonna support this so you guys get, get done what you need to do. My question though is, why is this even a conditional use permit for a temporary road that goes, that's gonna go away after construction is completed? Uh, well, it's not for the road so much per se, and yes, the the access roads will be removed as part of the project once the transmission line relocation is complete. Um, but to move the line itself um, is a conditional use so permit. So utilities are required for a conditional use permit? Uh, major public service utilities, such as a transmission line. Of course, we wouldn't do this for you know, service line, that sort of thing. Um, but yes, conditional use permit in pretty much every district except for industrial. So from a philosophical standpoint, and maybe I'm looking at the city manager now, um, <laughs> you know, as, as we've seen, a utility can put a line anywhere they want to put in as long as they're willing to do all the legal challenges. Um, so what's the, what's the reason behind requiring the, 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 special use permit or a conditional use permit? I suspect that this is something that's been in our ordinance for quite some time and could stand a review. Okay. All right, that's a fair question. Yes, sir. <clears throat> if we don't um, have to approve many of these <clears throat> because the state code provides that if the electric company gets approval from the state corporation commission, if it's a project that needs SCC review and approval, then that satisfies the local zoning ordinance. So most of our electric projects, they go to the SCC, and therefore they're exempt from our ordinance. But for many years, our ordinance has had a provision in it that's broad enough to require these types of facilities to get CUPs. It's just most of the time they don't need to because the project has been reviewed and approved by the State Corporation Commission. This is one where they did not get State Corporation Commission approval. They didn't need to. So then they fell within the zoning ordinance. Interesting. So the State Corporation Commission would approve probably new lines. Yes. And then that's when they would get involved. But for an existing line, a relocation of the existing transmission main or gas line or major gas line, mm -hmm. I guess a transit, a transmission gas line would, would require a CUP. Or an electric line that's of a certain size might need SCC approval. Oh. Um, uh, the, the zoning ordinance does um, have a, a development standard section for overhead electric power and transmission lines. Um, and there are several findings that it outlines. Um, you know, it needs to not adversely contradict the, co the comprehensive plan, um, adversely put health and safety at risk, um, that sort of thing. So that's okay. what the ordinance outlines for these. I, I, I think it may be, a, and I'm belaboring the point now, but I think it may be a, worth reviewing if it's, if it's worthwhile uh, to maintain that. Uh, it seems like health and safety would be paramount in, uh, in, the, in their considerations. Uh, maybe it wasn't 40 years ago, but, uh, but I don't know, maybe that's worth an update, but I won't believe it this anymore. Madam Mayor, like I said, I, I support this and ready to vote whenever council is. All right, thank you. Council Member Hagelson. Uh, thank you, I was gonna ask some of the same questions because I've been here a long time. I've rarely ever seen you know, a CUP to move a line. And thank you, AEP, for moving the line. I know as you stated, that's not something you wanted to do. Uh, I'm sure there's expense and, and hopefully uh, our city bureaucracy and, and rules, we can look at this to just to make sure that it's not something that, uh, uh, you know, I can understand if you're moving it on, on t having, having to move it on land that we don't own. But I imagine we have this whole easement, correct? Uh, or they have the easement or? These are private properties. 
But there's an easement. There is an easement. easement, yes. So there's an easement, so we move the line, or they're moving the line at you know, 20 feet kind of thing, or it's hard to tell by that map. You're asking how far they're moving it? Yeah. Um, I'll look to the engineer. Yes, come on, back to the podium. Thank <clears throat> you. Sure. I want to say it's maybe 150 feet. I don't have the exact dimensions. Okay. But um, just like I said, we had to acquire new easements. Uh, we had to deal with property owners. Like I said, it was a pretty significant amount of time. Like I said, an effort. And, and, and this was to because do that. VDOT. A, a bridge from VDOT's perspective in the clearing or something had to be moved? Or? Right. The exact, the exact situation is they need so much uh, radius for putting a crane next to replacing that bridge. Okay. So basically their, their swing radius that they have to operate was in the vicinity of our line. Okay. So since they had to work the bridge from our side where the line was at, there was no, you know, was no alternative but to move. Was there an alternative to bury the line? No, it's no. it's 138 kV. So okay, we typically okay. we can bury those, but that's extremely Th those expensive. aren't yeah. yeah okay. Well, thank you for we appreciate the electricity and we <laughs> our citizens appreciate the electricity and I don't think the uh, uh, as Councilmember Farrow stated maybe to look at because the health and safety I think there's lots of regulations regarding health and safety um, you know that's already there so anyway thank can, you. Can I ask one follow up mm -hmm. question? This is maybe related, but. Uh, so this has nothing to do with the the 138 uh, upgrade between Gladstone and Bank Excuse and uh, Joshua Falls. No, sir. This is a it's the same. Sim this, all right. But is it the line? I guess this is the line that feeds uh, Joshua Falls. Um, no. Hmm. Okay. Just curious. Thanks. Sure. sure. All right. Thank you. If there's no further discussion, thank you. Please cast your vote. And the motion passes seven to zero. Thank you, and good luck with the project. Next, under general business, number 12, report and recommendations from SCS engineers and city staff on the solid waste collection system evaluation. Discuss and approve recommendations for implementation in the fiscal year 2021 budget. And this is Ms. Gaynell Hart, Director of Public Works, who will provide us with a presentation. while they were getting that done? Or Ms. Severchik or Mr. did you want to say anything regarding the presentation or? Um, this is an item that we talked with you about during consideration of last year's budget mm -hmm. and it was on a list of a lot of major issues that we knew we needed to bring back to you. Okay. And I think this is the last item in that very long list. Mm -hmm. Thank you for keeping that long list. Every time I get up here, that thing does that, and I apologize. But anyway, mayor, vice mayor, and city council. Okay, thank you. Um, we are excited to be here tonight. Um, July 2018, I gave a presentation about the challenges and opportunities with our refuse collection system. Since then, we've contracted with SCS Engineering. Um, they are here as well as us to present their findings of their um, evaluation of our collection system and they've got some recommendations for us that I think are going to move things forward and really improve our system and make our city cleaner. Our agenda tonight is to review the guiding principles that we introduced at the July 10th, 2018 meeting. Um, we want to review and provide results of the SCS review of our curbside brush and bulk and recycling collection. We want to review the financial analysis that SCS did about our finances and possibly a way to move forward. We'll talk about next steps and hopefully discuss and approve some recommendations tonight. Um, on July 10th, when I introduced some of our major challenges and I'll review them really quickly, I think you're fairly familiar with them. Certainly overflow, trash on the ground was a major problem. Uh, the demand on our brush and bulk service where our neighborhoods looked very um, unkept and we were not able to keep up with the brush and bulk demand. The administrative complexity of our decal system, 
and the uncertainty, uncertainty in the recycling business, um, and as well as we have some illegal dumping at our recycling sites. So our guiding principles, just to remind you, are to be financially sound and self-sustaining. Right now, our revenue only covers about, oh, just a little over a third of the $3 million budget. So just wanted you to be aware of that. Of course, we want to contribute to economic development and tourism. We want a system that's easy for citizens to understand, and I think many of you have gotten complaints. One of the biggest complaints I get is we don't know whether we need to call in for brush in bulk or do you guys just come around and pick it up? But I think it needs to be a system that's very easy to understand. We want it to be um, uh, simple to administer, not complex. And at that July meeting, I discussed our decal system, how complex it was. It involves four uh, different city departments as well as a uh, private sector mailing uh, vendor, very complex, not easy to administer. And probably the greatest thing I would like to achieve is to create a sense of pride in our neighborhoods and clean up some of our neighborhoods. We've got brush and bulk sitting in our neighborhoods for a month to six weeks at times. Obviously, we want to be efficient and effective. We want to provide education and get our citizens into compliance about proper disposal of trash. So at this time, what I would like to do is introduce SCS engineers and our project team. Um, it is tonight, Bob Dick, Vita Quinn, and Ryan Duckett will be presenting the results, and I will come back and um, uh, finish up with talking about our next steps and, and possible future recommendations. So with that, I will turn it over to Bob. Thank you. Good evening, everybody. I'm Bob Dick with SCS Engineers. I'm uh, delighted to be here this evening. Appreciate the opportunity to present to you. I must say this is one of the most upbeat city council meetings so far that I've ever attended. My goal is to uh, extract even a fraction of the applause that was given to the uh, ladies track and field team, and I'll consider that a good night. It's been a very enthusiastic vibe here. I hope we can continue that on solid waste collection system evaluation. We hope you can um, too. Yeah. Well, we think it's awesome. So uh, uh, Brian and Vita are here. And um, SCS, uh, I'm a vice president out of the Richmond, Virginia office. And we've been doing solid waste. The company has for almost five decades here. And uh, we've been working for multiple cities looking at these issues in Virginia. I'm uh, going to try to go through. It's a rather comprehensive endeavor to study the city's collection, solid waste collection and recycling collection program. Uh, if you want to interrupt me at any time uh, during the presentation, you're welcome to do that. Otherwise, uh, after we finish, I'll be doing the portion on material collection evaluation, and my colleague Vita will be going through the financial analysis that we did. But you're welcome to save your, your questions or interrupt me at any time. Uh, you may be very uh, comfortable and aware of what your program is um, in the city. Uh, I will just give you kind of a summary quickly of the primary services uh, that are offered. Um, and, and this was discussed extensively in the report uh, that SCS developed, and I believe some of you have reviewed the executive summary of that report. The city um, provides weekly collection of solid waste to residents, and that's a curbside uh, collection program, and it's performed using city-issued carts. Um, there's two sizes of carts, 32-gallon and 64-gallon, so residents set that out. It's essentially uh, a mandatory participation uh, for residents. It's not openly advocated by the city that uh, citizens could perhaps contract with um, a third party private sector. And so the city expects to be the refuse collection uh, entity for about 21,000 households in uh, the city. In addition, oh, and, and to accomplish that, there's about six routes. In other words, six trucks are dispatched four days a week um, to accomplish that in the city. 
the city also uh, provides uh, solid waste collection services at the curb to um, smaller businesses, some commercial establishments, and perhaps some institutions like uh, churches that opt to use the city's carts. The bulk waste and brush pickup program, we think of that separately, um, oftentimes because it's accomplished by a separate vehicle. You may hear me use the term knuckle boom truck. It's got a grapple hook. And the idea there is for materials that cannot fit into the city issued cart can be set out and the city will dispatch a, uh, a crew to come and remove that uh, again from the curbside for residents. And it's both bulk waste Think of something like a piece of furniture um, and brush. I use that generically to mean all yard waste. The city has six unattended recycling drop-off centers. These are specific for recyclable materials. In other words, they're meant to be diverted from the solid waste and not go to the regional landfill. And um, in addition to that, there's at Concord Turnpike, where the Refuse Collection Administration Building is, there's a convenience center there as well for solid waste and various uh, other types of materials. The, uh, the city is essentially disposing of about 18,300 tons annually. Um, about 14,000 of that comes through the residential and commercial curbside program, and about 4,200 tons per year comes from bulk uh, waste and again brush is managed separately so the city attempts to not put yard waste into the regional landfill and that landfill is um, owned and operated by the region 2000 services authority uh, I refer to it as the livestock road landfill down in Campbell County it's in Rustburg and so there's about uh, a thousand tons of brush and 1,300 tons of recyclable materials that are being collected as part of that program city's program so uh, tonight what you'll hear is kind of the themes that I'll reiterate and will come up and were pervasive throughout our report are these key issues. The first being from a financial standpoint, uh, refuse collections is not revenue neutral. You heard uh, Ms. Hart uh, mention that a Right now, the manner in which the city um, collects revenues for this service is covering uh, less than 50%, maybe a little bit more than a third of the expenditures to accomplish these programs. The decal and bag system uh, is problematic. Essentially, the manner in which the city administers the uh, system to bill customers, it it uh, allows for some customers to essentially receive the services without paying. It's very uh, burdensome to administer, and she's covered that uh, in previous presentations, and the report goes into detail on that. Right now, the program uh, for capital uh, rolling stock replacement and equipment, it's, it's just not as rigorous as perhaps some of the other city programs when it comes to vehicle replacement. Um, it's not as formal or well-developed and as comprehensive as, it, as we believe it needs to be. The uh, things that the city's considering as far as operational and capital changes, um, I list uh, three items here, bulk and brush pickup, recycling drop-off, and automated collection. This is essentially the three primary categories that we knew when we uh, met with the city for the first time. Both sides of the table, both SCS and the city, uh, could understand that our focus need to be concentrated on these pressing issues because they're the most potential for efficiencies to be gained. And so uh, what SCS did was a materials collection evaluation. This involved um, ride-behinds, uh, personnel interviews, research of data, and a litany of our activities. And we broke these into the three primary categories. Um, the city does offer a high level of service, but as you'll kind of hear, uh, my tone is such that they do this despite being under-resourced and underfunded. Um, and so I want to talk about the weekly curbside collection, brush and bulk collection, and recycling in a little bit more detail here. One of the uh, themes, again, that you'll hear us uh, mentioning on all three of these uh, slides that I'm about to present is rules and enforcement. So there's just a lot of opportunity, uh, we believe, where the city code and ordinance 
um, has uh, sufficient rules, but they're just not being enforced because of the uh, nature of the solid waste collection workers to want to collect the refuse that's put out. And so some of the things uh, that Gaynell mentioned and were prevalent throughout our report was this practice of snow coning, uh, the idea that more waste is being generated from a customer and so it's being placed on top with the lid open and uh, bags are being placed beside it or unauthorized containers as well. And these are essentially uh, between decal issues, container size, and the billing format. All of these impose excessive logistical, operational, and administrative and financial burdens on the city um, that essentially impedes or inhibits a superior service delivery. When I wanted to mention uh, benchmarking throughout our evaluation, SCS compared and contrasted uh, what other cities are doing, not just in Virginia, but primarily in Virginia, because we knew you would have those type of questions. The term automated collection, uh, recognizing that you're not uh, primarily in the refuse collection business, the city currently uses semi-automated side loader vehicles, but the industry standard is fully automated. And so right now, when uh, a private sector uh, business is looking to purchase new vehicles and implement a, a curbside collection program, pretty much the best management practice or industry standard is fully automated vehicles. And so just so you understand, that's where a driver can be in a vehicle and automatically extend a mechanical arm to fully service the cart and it eliminates the need for laborers or crews that we all grew up with seeing on the back of the uh, refuse truck. And uh, as you can imagine, it improves safety and reduces injury. It increases efficiency, and there's many other advantages. In fact, our section 3.3 of our report deliberates all the uh, potential benefits, and, but there are some challenges, and one of those is um, it incurs additional capital costs for these vehicles. The last bullet on this uh, refers to a route optimization study. City of Lynchburg is similar to many cities, um, in fact, most cities that I've encountered, in that when you ask where do your drivers go in the morning when they're dispatched, um, they say, well, they seem to know where to go. And uh, we ask, well, have you done uh, a deliberate, intentional route optimization study um, in order to uh, guide the path-by-path -path route? And oftentimes, uh, cities haven't. And oftentimes, supervisors explain to a new driver or a new personnel come on, and that's uh, just kind of a, a legacy issue for cities. Let me talk briefly about the bulk and brush collection. This was definitely one of the areas that the report focused on extensively because it is probably the primary uh, uh, drain on the uh, programs here and it has essentially a lot of inefficiencies um, that the city has been trying to rectify. The city has been very diligent in trying different manners to uh, collect the brush in bulk. You have problems with set out size, the, the frequency and the type, the mix of brush and bulk imposes operational challenges since those materials are trying to get to two different destinations but get collected by a single vehicle. The benchmarking again, we consider different programs in uh, over 16 cities in Virginia and I can stand here and confidently say that all cities in Virginia are struggling with bulk and uh, brush collection more so than they struggle with some of the standard car curbside collections. So ultimately what you'll see in the report is there are multiple detailed recommended changes that SCS put forth. These were derived based on uh, our benchmarking and extensive uh, discussions with city personnel who are on the front line. Um, but 
put it in a nutshell, what we're recommending is a transition to the scheduled collections. In other words, a deliberate route would or section of the city would be assigned a certain week within the month to receive this. Um, we think it would eliminate extensive travel time and inefficiencies that are manifest now in the program and then ultimately to move to where it is mandatory to request a pickup. So right now, uh, as uh, Gaynell mentioned, sometimes certain customers are calling in, but many customers are not. And I think it just increases the city's capacity to better manage this critical program. The third uh, category, primary category, of, is the recycling program, and this was uh, deliberated or discussed extensively in section 3.4 of our report, uh, mentioned about 1,300 tons per year are diverted from the landfill um, and routed to a materials recovery facility. And as you can see, the primary challenges or issues are the inadequate signage. It's, it's always an education and outreach challenge in solid waste and especially in recycling. And we find ourselves currently in the midst of an unprecedented change or disruption within the recycling uh, market that was predicated based on China's national sword policy. And that was focused mostly on contamination. And contamination and recycling means where you have materials in the recyclables uh, stream that cannot be recovered and have to be removed and sent to a solid waste disposal facility. So the six um, unmanned drop-off sites uh, probably require supervision, uh, some level of manning the site and oversight there. Uh, you can expect, and, and what you'll see, and I think has already uh, occurred a little bit, is a dramatic increase in the hauling costs uh, by the contractor Sunoco, and uh, that's due to their increased costs, so they're passing it along uh, to not just City of Lynchburg, but all city recycling programs. When we mention issues with site locations, uh, the six, one has been eliminated uh, recently, but there's no leases, and so these are not on city-owned property, um, and they're, they're uh, unrestricted access to it, so illegal dumping of non-recyclable materials is a problem. And then the last thing here is we hear often, and, and rightfully so, from a segment of the population that is interested in curbside collections, and uh, City of Lynchburg is one of uh, just a few uh, Virginia first cities that don't offer curbside uh, collection of recyclables, but there are others, uh, so city's not the only one. And, and frankly, it may actually be to the city's benefit that you don't have a historical legacy uh, recycling program that needs to be restructured in some form to uh, basically modernize it, giving what's uh, gone to uh, what has manifested itself as a disruption in the market. And so what we recommend is cautiously to consider the potential to implement some program, and it may be a limited program, at a future date when there's both more stability and certainty um, from a market standpoint. But we need you to recognize that there is a substantial cost. So some of our analyses indicate that a ton of recyclables costs as much as a ton of solid waste to uh, manage in an environmentally responsible manner. The benchmarking uh, that we did as part of the evaluation was essentially to compare and compra contrast solid waste program elements uh, from four cities that were explained in great detail in the report. Um, and those three of those four cities were uh, first cities, Virginia first cities. And then in Appendix A, there's a matrix that compares and contrasts the major elements of all 16 Virginia first cities as a reference. Uh, the outcome there, we found that Harrisonburg, city of Harrisonburg, was probably the most similar. And I think the uh, the takeaway that the council needs to hear is certainly the conclusion that um, Lynchburg uh, lacks essentially a 
cost recovery of the, of the services that are being uh, delivered. And so while Lynchburg uh, does a lot for the citizens, the residents, and small businesses, and offers a lot of programs, the uh, revenues are, are certainly um, in the very lowest tier. And so with that, I'm gonna turn it over uh, to my colleague to go through some of the financial analyses that was in the report, and then I'll be back up here to wrap up, and then Gaynell will uh, go forth in more detail about the path that uh, the city should consider moving forward. Thank you. Hi, I'm Vita Quinn, Director of Management Services for SES, which the cliff notes on that means that I really specialize in working with general governments and utilities, particularly on the local level, developing financial solutions for just long-term financial sustainability. In the case of this study, what that really looks like, did I kill it? Oh, hey, look at that. Where's the, <laughs> you, I swear I give presentations. Thank you, no, that's okay. It's that one. All right, let's try that again. In, in this case, I was brought in because really when you start recommending operational changes and talking about uh, how the system looks, the next question is, that's great, but how are we gonna afford it? So coming in initially, the idea was to look at the baseline financial health of the city's solid waste operations. Simply put, do we have enough revenue to cover our expenses? If not, how much more would we need to be financially sustainable over a long-term projection period? And then, once the operational analysis is complete, come in and overlay some additional capital and other operational efficiencies and changes that you might implement and look at the change so that we can see what your financial health is to begin with and then see how much the changes would be from some of these recommendations. But immediately, um, I think what struck me is that you are significantly under collecting. I mean, I think we've talk talked about that significantly, but the decal and bag system in particular that's in place um, is, is very problematic because you don't have a customer database. You don't have an accurate way of billing annually, um, an accurate way of tracking the customers that may or not be paying. And so relying a bit on a code enforcement person to help with some of that enforcement is not necessarily the easiest way to administer that. And so we wanted to make some recommendations about ways that you might rethink how you actually collect your revenue that could result in some significant changes. Um, currently, the solid waste operations are part of the general fund, and while that means that any cash flow deficit that happens annually is, is funded by the general fund, so these operations are being paid for, it's not really the best way to look at a utility that really has a charge for services. It would, it would be ideal that they could work towards being revenue neutral. Some financially sustainable rate that would cover your cost of service so that those revenues from the general fund could be freed up for other purposes. Recommending, well, I'm recommending that we look at a transition to a monthly billing system. One of the meetings that we had with staff, we talked to the IT department and initially thought that it would not be possible for you to be able to do a combined utility bill, but with some more investigation, we realize that it actually is possible within the framework of your current billing system, which we understand is, is not the best platform, but there is a way to make that work. The advantage there being, now you have a customer database for your solid waste customers, and you have the ability to, um, to charge all of the customers within the city, all of your residential dwelling units, and they would have one combined utility bill that they could pay. The other thing that's beneficial is right now, those customers are paying an annual decal fee which, as you can imagine, for fixed income or very low income people, $110 a year might be a very significant cost to them. But if you break that up over 12 months in the form of a utility bill, it actually does benefit those low and fixed income customers uh, quite significantly. The, the change that we're expecting in your customer base is rather significant. Right now, you have about 14,000 customers that are purchasing decals. And a quick review of the city's parcel database and the number of dwelling units that you have in the city, it could potentially be 21,000 customers that are paying, which would obviously take some of the pressure off of those rate adjustments for all of the customers because now you really have more people um, covering that cost that you need to cover. Um, it, 
will eliminate the abuse that you have now with the decal system and again makes one bill that your customers would have to pay. Oh, I should have mentioned that this is also working off the assumption that was in the recommendations that the city would transition to 96 gallon containers. The basis for this being with your billing system, it would be significantly easier to manage than the pay as you throw system that you have now, which would have multiple can sizes and you might potentially need to update that, ba that uh, database on a more regular basis. This would essentially be 96 gallon cans for all of your residential units. Um, sure. Go back to that last. So he had mentioned in his presentation in the beginning that there is 21,000 customers, and now you're saying there's only 14,000 paying customers because he mentioned there's 21,000 that are being customers. served. No, not potential. 21,000 are being served. So the city has a policy which a makes sense of not having to get having to pay because of a. Uh, poverty numbers or something or what's the uh, I, you're just simply not capturing everyone in the city you have a policy that if there's waste left at the curb it gets collected and there is an enforcement in place where they try to monitor uh, the cans and take a look and see who may not have a recent decal but because that enforcement is always going to be chasing those people you just have a natural lag in that customer base and right now that's rather significant so a lot of this, I guess the rest of this, um, the assumption is covering the cost, but obviously there's years ago, uh, this was part of the taxes, so it was part of the general fund, so it obviously covers the cost because that cost is being broken down based on citizens paying taxes. And so, and there's lots of other things. Um, you know, this is something I think that everybody in the city does is throw away something. You know, not everybody in the city uh, has kids that go to the public schools or uses the fire department or the police department, but those are things that are born as part of the, the tax of the, uh, so why would this be different? Uh, was that the charge that you were given um, to say how you can make this revenue neutral or, or without using the, de the uh, general fund or? I, I think or, the same uh, argument can be made for water and wastewater. I mean, we all wash our hands and flush our toilets too, but it is a utility. And it, it has a very significant cost of service, first of all, and also, it's generally, the, yeah. it's generally handled by a charge for service. And in this case, we have some kind of hybrid system because it simply just isn't collecting enough revenue. And it would make sense. Also, we're dealing with residential units here, the customers that you serve. And there are customers in your city um, who pay haulers to haul their waste that aren't served by the city. So it would be best to recover those costs of providing that specific service to the customers allocating those costs to the customers that actually benefit from that service. In the case of the general fund, it's generally for the, the general good, like you're saying, police and fire, and you can't necessarily as easily, I'm from Florida, so yes, you can <laughs> allocate fire assessments or things like that to uh, allocate that benefit to individual residents. But in the case of a utility, it's much easier to quantify I guess, I guess the difference, and I appreciate the, the comparison, but when you're washing your hands or flushing the toilet, you're usually in the privacy. Um, but when you're putting trash, that is in the public purview. I mean, so that's on the curb, that people drive up on a public street and see all this. So I think they're, they're fairly vastly different. But um, I, I, that answered a l at least a little bit of it where it's coming from. Thank you. Yeah, it, it's just that it, it really is a utility and there is a service that's being provided that can easily be quantified, much less so than how does having police officers, you know, one for every thousand residents benefit me individually. It's much harder than to say, what is the cost to put two drivers in a truck, have them come over and tip a can from my yard into that truck? I can quantify that cost. Therefore, it's most easily supported by a charge for service. Uh, versus, like I said, the general government being for the general welfare and public good. That would be how I could best explain it. And then, so if it is that, then that would be something that then you could then outsource as opposed to having it inside. If it's, if it's not for the public good, um, that would be then something that you would say, hey, let's at least, you know, see what the total cost is and, you know, outsource it. You could. I've worked with utility privatizations. I mean, it's, it's definitely something that some areas consider. Um, sometimes people just realize they, they maybe aren't in the business of running utilities anymore. Um, but 
it's not necessarily something that you have to do. It's just something where your revenue might best be recovered through a direct means from those customers that are benefiting. Thank you. So we got data, oh, this slide does not say much, but this we collected data from your finance department and from um, Solid Waste and really talked to them about making sure we were interpreting your financials correctly. <clears throat> and then we brought it into a model that we have that's specifically to look at what we call revenue sufficiency. Do my revenues um, pay for my expenses? This slide just sort of gives you the idea of what the model does. It's, it's cash flows. If your cash in is greater than your cash out, you're building up fund balance. In a long term, that's a financially sustainable plan. If your cash out's greater than your cash in, that's fine as long as you have a significant fund balance. But at some point, you're going to run out. And in the long term, that plan's not sustainable. So the model's built around that mindset. This is a lot to look at. And it has a lot of strange things happening. That's OK. I'll show you what you need to see. Um, this is the level of rate adjustments that we're projecting. Um, and this is under your current system. What's significant about this slide, and there's two things you want to look at, because like I said, I, I realize that there's a lot going on. The green line here is your cash in, and the red bars in the gray shaded area is your cash out. So anytime those bars go above the green line, green line it means you're spending down fund balance. This is a recommended rate plan that we put in place with the goal of this graph showing us your fund balance, which obviously is nothing right now. The fund is dependent on the general fund for money. We were trying to make a plan to get to a financially sustainable place in about 10 years. With the goal of a utility generally having about two to three months of, or about three to six months of O&M expenses or operations and maintenance expenses as a fund balance that you can use to work on for a working capital during the year. So we tried to move toward three months of operations and maintenance expenses as that fund balance target. So this is what you're looking at there is by fiscal year 2027, you start to actually be able to grow a fund balance and the projection would be that by fiscal year 2030, you could actually have that much um, in, the, in the fund balance with the idea of it being treated more like an enterprise fund. However, if you move so let me just point out here, you did the 37.5% rate, rate adjustment this year. We're projecting the need for 30% for the next two years and then 20% after that. Some lower adjustments, but moving towards inflationary-like rate adjustments by the last couple of years of that projection period. If, however, you move to monthly billing, and this is not assuming any of the additional capital investment from this study, but if you transition to the month, monthly billing and you were able to capture that additional customer base, now those level of rate adjustments are slightly lower. It's one year of 30%, then 26 and 15, some lower adjustments here. And again, returning to uh, inflationary type rate adjustments in the out years. Again, with the same solution in mind that we're moving toward financial sustainability by 2030. The third scenario we considered is what happens if we do try to fund some of this additional capital, uh, some of these automated collection vehicles or whatever else is being recommended. We just basically tested a scenario where what if you could spend $300,000 a year starting in fiscal year 2021 to fund some of these strategic capital projects. In that case, you now have a rate adjustment of 30 and then 26 and this one goes up to 20 and 6% and then again inflationary type by the out years. In either of these scenarios, it is still a better situation than it would be currently under the decal system. Um, it's just a matter of making the decisions regarding how council wants to proceed. Uh, hi, just an <laughs> observation. Uh, when I was reviewing these, I, I, I'll tell you frankly that I wasn't a, a big fan of the increases, uh, not at all, significant increases. Um, what you're doing is effectively once you hit twenty dollars a month, you've effectively doubled the the amount that everybody's paying per can right now. One hundred ten dollars for a regular size can annually. Um, by the time you you know, it's, whatever, just under ten dollars a month, you hit twenty dollars, you're, you're you're right there. You've doubled it. Uh, it seems almost like a bait and switch to some extent. So why not at in two thousand nineteen? 
hold the have it at a uh, hundred and ten dollars uh, a year annual or a month on a monthly basis it'd be well over six dollars so why not make it you know ten dollars a month and start off earlier and get a I guess get a better start out out of it I'm not a hundred percent sure I understand a month a year for a can right and that's divide that by 12 as of fiscal year 2020 we're saying on top of that you st still need that additional revenue right if the if solid waste operations are to be treated eventually like an enterprise fund where they're revenue neutral and where right. they have enough working capital to work off of this is a plan that puts you on that path without trying to say we need a 115 percent rate increase this year but a path that allows you to fund that great operation that sense. you have now and any additional capital why are you starting at 950 a month effective year. monthly fee at 950 for for this year, you're at for nine, nine, 917. We're 20 now, that's right. Yes. 667 was last year. So is the 917 effectively 110 divided by 12? Yes. Yeah. Okay. Well, that's the math then. How's, all right, so what, and we're having 19 on there for what reason? Because that was the year that we, this study started. I mean, you're, you're oh. in the transition between fiscal years during this study. Ah, okay. Also, sometimes if we catch you right at the beginning of fiscal year, we have much better data from the prior year than we really do for the current one. So we All right, so we need to be that. focusing on 2020 and beyond and yes. not the first. first You're really first focusing slide. on 2021 and beyond because 2020, you've already implemented that rate adjustment. So 2021 is the first year that any of this would apply. So, all right, thank you. Okay. And so this, these adjustments looking through 2030 would take care of the capital expenditures the of the trucks and making it cost neutral and would that be reducing uh, staff like you mentioned if we went with an industry standard or is that what Ms. Hart will talk about no I, I can speak to that part okay. this is fully funding your operations as they are as they are right now uh, with the understanding that even if you make some of these operational changes, there's probably a lag and you're realizing a revenue difference or a cost savings from that. So maybe we develop some efficiencies here and maybe some of those rate adjustments in the out years, you know, might not need to be as high as is currently projected. Mm -hmm. But without having implemented that and really knowing, it's, it's pretty tough to say. Mm -hmm. um, and it may not be significant enough to really significantly change the rate plan. But it does, in this scenario, funds also the additional capital that we're recommending. But within the study itself, it does account for necessary hiring, necessary vehicle replacements, and necessary additional vehicles to fund your fleet as it is. Councilmember Wright. Just for the bottom point, you know, we are currently operating at a deficit, but the, at least the, as a as a service as, as a service goes. We are otherwise supplementing it with a general fund. Yes. So the taxpayers are picking up the, the tab no matter if they pay for the decal or otherwise. And this is really the proposed plan here is just to ensure that people who are actually using the service are actually paying for it as opposed to people who might not be using the service but who are currently paying for it. Right. And, and that, you know, that, that would be the concern is that you do have, like I mentioned, commercial entities that have separate solid waste service that's not serviced by the city but it is coming out of their taxes and also if you think of the the most fair way to charge the customers you know I I don't generate waste based on the size of my house necessarily but I do generate it based on the size of my container or the frequency of my service so that's the the argument again for that utility billing what you said a minute ago because a minute ago you said Let's not have two sets of cans. Let's have one 96-gallon can. So right now there's two sizes of cans. So if you use less, it doesn't matter because everybody's got the same 96-gallon uh, can. So we, we, uh, that, okay, that that's a that's a little bit more specific than I was. Well, was, yeah, but I mean you're saying, saying so. Yes. If you have nothing in your can, you still pay for it, right? Right. If you have a bag in your can, uh, and. and you know, I think this is, you know, I'm sure we could spend lots of time looking at this, but I don't know if anybody thinks it's a great thing to say, uh, let's, you know, if it's coming from the general fund, great, then we'd have a plan that lowers the taxes commensurate with the increase, but you're looking at a 30% increase each year uh, for a lot of years. And so, you know, maybe other folks think that's a pretty neat thing uh, to put on our citizens, but 
Well, I, th I think there'd be other ways to do it. As so. I think has been mentioned, though, the citizens are paying for this now. It's how it's allocated to them is not being fairly allocated. And again, you're not doing it with other utilities like water or wastewater. We're charging for the services that are provided. So, and you are charging for services provided. You're just under collecting, and the general fund is footing the bill currently. With the with the tax assessments. And, and so the general. So if so, you're, it's actually then would be double. So if we're saying, hey, we're going to collect this from the people using it, great, then you actually have the, the tax rate lowered commensurate with the money that was being subsidized. You definitely could do that. No. Mm -hmm. Or if there's a need, I don't, I don't know what your budget process looks like this year, but you know, instead of going to have to raise your tax rates, maybe you can use some of that money then to fund those additional budget costs that you're facing in the upcoming years. It's, it's freeing up capital for the general fund, and while I'm happy to make recommendations on that and we definitely could work with you on that it's something that you would have to make some strategic decisions about how you wanted to to but, use those funds that are potentially being freed up so the idea is not to make your customers pay twice but to make the customers that are benefiting pay for the service and let your tax be representative of public good thank you uh, councilmember nelson oh, had sorry. a point that he wanted to <clears throat> thank you very much madam mayor uh, i have a couple of questions and and some real issues, but I don't want to interrupt your presentation because I want to see and hear you finish. But I want to understand, you've made points that I thoroughly agree with, that having a mandatory billing to the, each property in this city is a lot simpler and it's a lot more accurate. And it, it certainly uh, allows everybody who uses to pay something. But the first question I have is, who gets billed? Does the owner of the property get billed? Because certainly the city doesn't have the wherewithal to find out who the tenants are. We actually went back and forth on this because that was another consideration we have is that you all have a very good property tax database. So you would have the ability to build parcels or you would have the ability to put it on uh, the utility bill which goes to the person living, the tenant at the property. Sometimes. Sometimes. But generally speaking, that, that question was tossed around. It is easier to do the monthly utility bill method. You can add it to the system, it automatically gets you know, billed with all the other utilities, and you don't have the issue of trying to associate accounts with parcels, which can be problematic, as you can imagine, in downtown sure. areas where you might have multiple dwelling units on one parcel or where you might have, uh, I always give the example of a strip mall, which could be six businesses spread over three different parcels, and some of those businesses you do serve. That, that have smaller cans. So it's worth considering that that's a more difficult approach. And we were very happy when we found out that that monthly utility bill was an option. As far as the options that you have, you know, sticking with the decal system, trying to use the tax database or the monthly utility billing, the utility billing is really the preferable approach for that reason, the ease of administration. But to make the assumption that every occupied dwelling unit has a designated segregated water billing or sewer water billing uh, meter yeah. is a great assumption from my experience with landlords and property owners in Lynchburg and it's, yes. it can so easily be played and manipulated and unfairly applied and, and I think that's a problem that if we don't like collecting sending out notices and saying your decal is due um, and then getting a payment for it and then sending the decal. We don't like that. The alternative that you're talking about in the realities of Lynchburg will present, in my opinion, a huge problem. I, I definitely understand where you're coming from because yes, you're gonna have uh, master metered accounts for water and wastewater, right? In which case this is coming to the property owner, but I own a lot of property. You just- right divide that up among the tenants and have them pay their bills. That's, that's how their water okay. and wastewater bills are allocated as it is. It's just they will see an increase in that rate according to that solid waste service. All right, I'm gonna make one more comment and then let you proceed. When the program we're currently using was first adopted, the city had a, a vitalic effort to place a, a vivid red violation marker on the can that the waste collector observed to be snow coned or have extra trash outside that can or no decal at all. 
I don't, I, and I saw those raid uh, violation stickers many, many times, and I haven't seen any in about four, four years or so. When you, if somebody had a red sticker decal on their can, that was a stigma. You didn't want your neighbors to see it. You didn't want people who knew you to, to know that you played the system. Are we not enforcing that anymore? We are. Because I, it's easy enough. It doesn't need somebody to come along behind. The guy who picks it up can say, no decal. Sticker goes on, and if it happens again, they get fined. Actually, um, yes. Yes, that's correct. We actually are enforcing. We have... Um, in four years, we have issued 38,000 violations, so we've been busy. Um, we have seen a significant improvement in how people are doing their trash. Once we start enforcing, we, we, uh, we see people starting to purchase the decal because most people want to do right. Once they get the violation, then they come ahead and they go ahead and buy the decal. It has improved snow coning. It has improved the blue bags. I see people using the blue bags, and it really did clean up our neighborhood. Our person that does the violations uh, does a good job documenting. He actually takes photos of what he is um, writing the violation for. We actually have citizens call in and try to dispute their violations saying, no, I didn't have right. a bag, you know, by my can or whatever. And we've got photos that show that there is. So we're, we're very thorough about it and try to be very fair about it. And, and so, yes, we, we are steadily writing violations. Okay. And we've been writing violations. During the decal season, like October, we do give people a little break in that month, mm -hmm. just that one month, just in case people haven't purchased it, that type of thing. We'll still write up snow coning violations, that kind of stuff, but we try to give people a break in the month of October. All right. Uh, you've answered that specific question. I'm, I'm going to stop there. Thank okay. you. Thank you. Violations and the third one they find or something or how does that work? Yes, there's actually three violations and you get a twenty-five dollar fee. After that, they get a couple of more violations. You we do. Get it? We get the citizen gets the twenty-five dollars. We we charge a fee of twenty-five dollars, which sometimes is collected and sometimes not. If they continue to violate, we have suspended trash collection before. It's very difficult to um, monitor and to work with. And again, if we're leaving trash in a neighborhood, that's always gonna be problematic. So generally we end up picking it up, but we have actually suspended people and they came down and got their decal. So just want you to be aware of that. Thank you. All right. Mr. Uh, the reason I'm having trouble getting my head around the numbers is I think we're missing the base case. I don't know how much we are spending on a annual basis now versus what our revenues are now it seems to me in if we're 2019, missing 19 uh, it was uh 2.1 million deficit, deficit. 2.1 million deficit well that that would have been helpful to to be able to say because i was trying to figure out how if we've got if we're looking at a 50 percent increase in revenue how we're not covering our expenses yeah you need so do you it, it, it can you guys give us kind of a base case that looks like that so that we understand where we stand and where the projections are. I mean, I have graphs that look like that that let this go negative, but all we're essentially saying is that any negative, so if you're looking at this fund balance graph, right, we could have negative bars here. But what that, all that really means is that that's what the general fund is paying for. So in the detailed schedules to the but report. But it's the control. Yeah. It, it provides a control for us to compare the I usually against. do that and show things side by side in this case because it was just there was no money so kind of this is your status quo and it actually takes this long before you break even so these rate adjustments are just getting you to the point where you become revenue neutral just break even without even a fund balance by 2027 it's um, you can see that a little bit more detailed in the detailed schedules of the report, how that slowly tapers off, that need for the dependency on the general fund. And I just want to clarify, because I understand these rate adjustments are, are drastic. They're a lot to look at. I'm not, I'm not being flippant about this. I understand that, that residents have to pay for this. My suggestion is, though, that it's currently being funded by the residents and maybe we just look at how we fund it differently. I'm not at all saying that you shouldn't maybe consider how that you could alleviate some tax burden along with that. 
but just maybe charge the customers for the services that are being provided a little bit differently than you've been charging them. And in a way that I think will eventually allow staff some, some time savings and some efficiency when they're not dealing with this burdensome administration of these rates and how they're collected. Thank you. Let you finish, I'm sorry. Were there any questions <laughs> before you continue? No. Okay. This kind of gets to the point that we've all been talking about where you are relative to, to other cities maybe in, in providing these services. Right now, the effective monthly rate for Lynchburg is really lowest on this survey, even with the rate increase that you just implemented. So this was as of the end of fiscal year 2019. Uh, even with that, it still only puts you in the lower part of, of the group of entities that we surveyed. We do know that Staunton actually implemented a 15% rate increase this year, and we've been working with the city of Waynesboro. And while they're still in a similar situation and heavily um, dependent on the general fund, the need for rate adjustments, if they were to try to become revenue neutral, would be similar to yours. Just simply, a lot of these utilities are dependent on the general fund, and maybe these, aren't, these rates are not really fully reflecting the cost of service. So I think that this is your the situation is not unique. It's just trying to make a plan that, that maybe will help you in the long run. And this I think is useful to help you understand where you are and how costs have really surpassed you. Uh, the red line here is the US garbage and trash CPI, which is essentially the CPI reflecting how much consumers pay for solid waste year over year. And that goes up, as you would imagine, several percent per year. And this is what Lynchburg's rates have been. And that's basically they have been constant for a very long time. And these projected revenue increases on this graph would look like we're saying, wow, that's very, you know, it's far in excess of CPI. But if you look at the time value of that money, basically what we're saying is, if you had implemented the garbage and trash CPI adjustments or something similar to that, you'd be here. Even with these significant rate increases that we're projecting, it's still not even catching you up to what inflation has been over the last 20 years. So if that helps you to quantify a little bit, there really has been just a growing gap in the revenue and the cost for service, and that's why these rate adjustments look very drastic now. CPI for trash there is huh. it's like the water and sewerage maintenance index if you're familiar with that which is tracking the water and sewer costs to the customers the garbage and trash so, it, so that's a national uh, it's a CPI it's a component of the of the overall US CPI which takes into account a larger basket of goods okay and so with this is it is it typically dealing with municipalities or is it is trash done uh, you know by private haulers and stuff as well or is that just a yeah, it's not that specific. Okay. Or at least not what I'm using. There may be components of that that you could get more specific and more localized, but this is just the overall. Okay. Thank you. So our recommendations, again, are that you consider switching to a monthly billing system for the ease of administration to be able to really capture revenues from the customers that you're already <coughs> serving but that aren't actually paying for those solid waste services currently that um, you adopt a financial management plan and consider some series of rate adjustments. So it'll begin to move you towards uh, capturing your cost of service within your, your charges for services. And that, um, as, as was shown in that last scenario, that you consider that you might need to fund an additional several hundred thousand of, of capital uh, for some of these operational changes that might happen in the future. Now I'll let Bob go ahead and wrap it up, unless anyone else has any questions for me. Okay. Any questions? Thanks. Thank you. The evaluation uh, was fairly uh, comprehensive. It was probing in nature in that we uh, looked into the logistics of the operations. Um, it addressed uh, numerous uh, issues uh, both within the finances and the delivery of services and uh, so the city should consider uh, the following issues and Ms. Hart will go into a little bit more wrap-up of what uh, the next steps are 
the executive summary as well as sections 3.5 and 3.6 of a report were uh, exhaustive in terms of SCS's uh, recommendations as it pertains to the three primary uh, categories of activities that are administered by the solid waste and recycling collections program by the city of Lynchburg. We've talked about moving towards revenue neutrality. We've talked about the manner of billing customers for the service. Uh, one thing that I mentioned uh, was the need for more extensive route optimization and balancing of the routes um, with the existing uh, fleet and should any programmatic changes occur. I think that the changes to the uh, bulk and brush collection are absolutely necessary and imperative um, as we see a growing trend in which there continues to be an increase in the quantities of brush and bulk that are set out for the city to collect. We think that there's approximately uh, two of the six routes that could be transitioned to automated collections. As you can imagine, not all streets and alleys uh, within the city are conducive to automated collection, which does involve a bigger vehicle. Uh, we think uh, back on the, the bulk and brush collection, just to give you an example, um, and these are just a few of the uh, concepts we advocated for was separate vehicles for bulk and brush, implementing the scheduled route within a defined zone, and moving to mandatory notification or request uh, for the service. We also uh, suggested that two knuckle boom trucks and uh, drivers be incorporated in addition to the current uh, crews that perform that service. We talked about consolidating uh, recycling sites, the unmanned, this, the existing six, which are now, I believe, five uh, unmanned recycling sites are kind of a legacy that's not going to function adequately and sufficiency, uh, sufficiently in the modern era. And we think that uh, adding an additional full-time equivalent uh, staff to the uh, program department specifically for increasing enforcement and with a, a very defined and deliberate emphasis on education and outreach is necessary as well. All right, well now we're on the next steps and we're getting a little bit, thank you. We're getting a little bit more specific about what we recommend. Um, we do believe that we need to uh, revise our ordinances to tighten up brush and bulk. And in particular, we see people actually just taking a handful of clothes out and dumping them at the curb and those kind of things. We really need to tighten those type of things up. So we do think that we need to really uh, tighten up our refuse ordinance in particular with brush and bulk. We also want to establish clear set out procedures for residential trash. Um, we want to enhance our enforcement to incentivize customer compliance. I talked a little bit with community development staff. They do a lot of work with the private enforcement of litter and trash in yards. And they recommended that, that we go to some type of a fee-based system if people are not following. In, instead of trying to take people to court, that's not very effective. It clogs up the court system. It's not something judges want to do. But we want to look at, at enhancing enforcement, and that would include an additional enforcement employee as well. Um, all these, um, all these recommendations we've brought forth to city council for approval but we would like to go ahead and start working on revising our ordinances and updating them in preparation to to tighten some things down um, we definitely uh, we have four departments working on this uh, decal system all four departments would like to see us uh, move to some type of a monthly billing it's just very cumbersome it's difficult for people to understand it's difficult to enforce um, it's just going to be much easier, again, for people to pay. We just think it's the right, uh, right thing to do. We think we can use normal collection processes. Uh, finance was a part of the team that worked on this, so they were a part of reviewing this as well. Um, it will streamline a lot of things with no decal. 
Um, it, we can free up some, some resources because right now we're having to enforce no decals wrong size so that it'll free some of those type of things up and we think that this is some pretty low-hanging fruit we think this can be developed within our own city staff and so we'd like to move forward with that with the idea that when decals are up for renewal again in 2020 that we would have a monthly billing system prepared to try to implement at that time Um, we also like the idea that SCS recommended of assigning a schedule for brush and bulk. And again, we're thinking about doing that based on refuse day. We think most people understand which day they set out the refuse. It's very clear to them so that we could potentially say if, if you, for instance, in the, in the month of November, if you have Monday trash service, you set up your brush and bulk on Monday, November 4th. We will put all of our resources in that area, all of our trucks, and we will comb that area and clean that up. If your brushes, or if your bulk, I'm sorry, if your residential collection is on Tuesday, your brush and bulk collection will be no, Monday, November 11th. Again, put all of our resources in that area, get it cleaned up. That's gonna prevent us from running across town doing hot lists and, and potentially wasting resources. So we'd really like to tighten that down. Uh, we also recommend potentially closing one additional uh, recycling site. Some of the facts on that are uh, the Lakehorn site off of Old Forest Road was recently closed due to a business needing more parking. That site collected 340 tons of recyclables. Um, our top sites are the Kroger at Timberlake and the Kroger at Boonesboro, and they collect 700 tons and 625 tons annually. <laughs> Uh, the site that we're recommending to close is at Concord Turnpike. It would be the recycling site that's at the extension office up on top of the hill. It collects 18 tons annually. So we feel like that's one we can close and use those resources in some other uh, area. We would like to complete the routing study. We have contracted with SCS to work with us on that. We think we need to balance our routes. Tuesday, we get done fairly early. Thursday, we are barely making it in and getting to landfill on time. We think we can rebalance some of our routes and make it better for the refuse collectors and potentially maybe potentially save overtime on Thursday, depending on what's going on with that. Um, again, we're hoping that this recycling or the refuse routing study, potentially we could look at the automated collection and see which streets and areas we might be able to do that on and hopefully also identify some safety issues, such as sometimes we have to back down, completely back down a residential street. So we're hoping that maybe with the routing study, we can look at some of those type of safety issues. One thing I would like to update you on that's not on the slide is we made some changes to landlord set out um, procedures. Um, I, we got some unexpected data during, the, um, during this period of time. We, we met with the sheriff's office and we started receiving the writs. The writs are the official eviction notices. They have a list, I believe it's twice a week. We've been uh, getting those writs. We uh, ask our enforcement person to do inspections on those writs. Uh, and for the month, he inspected um, 65 writs in the month of August and September. And we got some surprising data from that. Of the 65 writs that were given by the um, sheriff's office 16 were canceled at the last minute because they the people were able to resolve their issues financially 33 did not have any set out at all so they weren't generating any trash 10 did not receive collection so we did not go to those sites to see if if, if there was anything set out and there were six set outs five were just minor normal set outs and there was really one only one whole house set out so we're not sure that tr the true landlord eviction that's going through the court is the problem. We did have a meeting with community development to discuss this, and we wonder if there's just not illegal dumping happening, potentially even a, a, um, a larger apartment complex, potentially that uh, uh, is not eligible for trash collection or a resident from a place not eligible tr for trash collection could potentially just be dumping things. And we also uh, think that potentially people that are flipping homes 
that if there's a lot of junk in the home and they're trying to flip it and renovate it, that they're taking that trash and setting it out. And that could be some of our problem. Again, that's anecdotal data from the, uh, from the people working the street. It's, we didn't do any in-depth um, analysis of that, but that's just something that we found with the landlord set outs that I wanted to update you on. So with that, after we did that, I kind of had spoke with lots of people and I kind of made that somewhat assumption that it wasn't as bad from the landlord standpoint. Obviously, you put something forward that we approved, so hopefully you'll bring something back that we can uh, hopefully nix if that's not uh, if that's not the issue so and I think what we want to do is when we when we're looking at our ordinances and we bring them back we'll see if we can find a solution um, I that think and recently so I hope we'll I hope we can do that fairly quickly to un undo it and I do think that we need to come up with a, a solution for excessive set outs I think we that definitely needs to be part of the ordinance it doesn't matter whether you're a single family resident and you set your whole house out or whether you're a landlord and set your house I, I do think we need to find some solutions to that so that the landlord was guilty even though it may not have been the landlord. That is the problem. Well, and again, we just, um, it is 65 writ, so it's its a limited amount of data. It's two yeah, months worth of data, but we did think it was worth bringing to you guys. Um, we'll continue to, we are continuing to watch it, and we will, again, I think the, the way to deal with that is excessive set out. So I think we can still find a solution to that. It's just, it might look a little different and include more, more people that potentially could be abusing our brushing bulk system. So, um, so and just a question, because we did have a lot of focus on it. Could it also be that landlords got better on taking their own trash? I, I mean, certainly it's possible. I mean, I'm, I'm just asking, because yeah. we did put the focus on it. We, we did focus on it, and uh, certainly that's very possible that people just figured that they would clean, clean themselves up. That's always the hope anytime you do some type of especially public thing like that that's certainly the hope um but yeah so we will come up with, with the solution for excessive set outs okay thank Bring you that back. i just wanted to ask the question and of course if we as we implement anything new we will be working with joanne martin's office communication and marketing and working on our education Future budget stuff, this is for FY 2021, 20, uh, and this is kind of a lot of things that SES engineers um, alluded to. We definitely feel like we would move, like to recommend moving towards refuse service fee and moving toward revenue self-sufficiency. Again, it's gonna be over a 10-year period, basically, but we think this is the right move and the, and the way to move forward. Uh, again, in FY 2021, we would recommend adding one additional education and enforcement employee. We have one full-time employee. He tr can get around the city about twice uh, enforcing decals. He works some on brush and bulk, but he is not able to enforce everything. So we do believe that we need one more position. Again, we, um, we do document and make sure that we've got good documentation so that if people question it, we've got an ability to have backup and make sure that it's done fairly um, and equitably. I will say of the 31,000 violations that we have um, issued, we have only had, we've had people dispute them and when we present the evidence, usually they just accept it. Uh, we had one dispute, I believe that I overturned and I am the person that reviews those, but most people, once we show them the photos, accept that they just need to do a little better and we talk about compliance and getting and educate them and we move on our way. So, um, 38,000 in four years, yes. Um, we also believe we need to purchase another knuckle boom truck. We try to run four to five every single day. Those trucks are running six days a week. Um, they're running until eight at night. Um, so they're working 12, 14 hours a day and we're unable to keep up. We, so there's, um, there's some overtime costs that we think that we potentially could reduce um, as a part of this. So again, when we're talking about, um, when we're talking about monthly fees, um, we were very conservative in how we approached that. And so we think if we hire some folks that we might be able to do, um, do some overtime. So we believe we need to do that. We also recommend bringing recycling back in house. 
Um, right now, Sunoco, while they do a very good job, uh, they are a local recycler. Uh, they haul our recyclables for us. Um, the costs have been increasing, a lot of it due to the changes in the recycling business. We would like to bring that back in house. We feel like we can be more efficient with it. We feel like we can clean the sites better. Um, we feel like we'll have some control over our costs. Right now there are some escalators in that contract that are kind of unknowns that we're not able to control. So we would like to bring our recycling hauling back in house. And finally, we like the recommendation from SCS of re refurbishing our recycling bins and improving our signage. And we think that potentially we could do that fairly cheap, um, potentially with some temporary employees or perhaps even some people that need to work off court time. Um, again, beyond FY 2022 and beyond, we again are hoping to move toward a uh, basically an enterprise fund. We do recommend implementing one cart size. Um, it's a lot of administration. We swap carts out. Um, if we're going to increase fees, this is going to give, give people more space to throw things away. I will say that part of, in, in the report, uh, SCS's report, uh, they, as they did the ride along or ride around, 63% um, of the carts were at or over capacity in the particular route that they followed, which tells me that many people need some more space to throw things away. Maybe that will help us keep some of the trash off the ground and in a cart. So we really would like to recommend doing that. Um, and again, we would like to purchase the knuckle boom in 2021 and then add the knuckle boom drivers in 2022. It takes six months or eight months to get those trucks. So we're trying to just buy them and then start up in the following year. Uh, Of last Tuesday at election day and just uh, as I was coming up to one of the polls that I was going to help work this 80 year old lady was coming down in her walker trying to get her can and so she had a pretty small can and so I guess the you know I recognize the the, the, the concept of having the big can but some of these are senior citizens I mean it's a difficulty already um, you know that's kind of a, a non-starter I think but well and I think um, one of the services we offer is door service um, so that if you are handicapped or elderly and you cannot get your can to the door, we, we have a form that you fill out, you take it to your doctor. We receive probably one or two of those, maybe three a month, and then you get door service. Um, we recognize that some people might want the smaller can for health reasons, um, again, elderly, potentially um, having some physical disabilities. That's something definitely we can look at. We anticipated that some of those might, we might need to be able to be a little bit flexible. I will say with having one can, um, number one, it reduces those cart swaps and it makes repairs easier. I, I, I really at least would only wanna have two sizes of cans. We've gotta keep parts and everything to repair those cans is much easier. Again, we were trying to go simple and so we would like to kind of consolidate down to one can and it does give people um, a little bit more space. So I, I agree with you. I, I think we're gonna try to consider that if we move forward with the cans. Um, again, adhering to a, a solid uh, vehicle replacement program. Again, working with the fleet directory does a great job, but he is also very stressed with needs in the general fund. So we'd wanna work with him on getting a, a very strong re vehicle replacement. And as finally, basically, um, we wanna implement any recommendations from the routing study. And so with that, I will uh, close and answer any questions or comments. Councilmember Wilder. Thank you for the presentation. I really appreciate that. Um, that is, this is definitely one of the major calls I get continuously is about trash and, our, and especially World War II. Um, so make sure I understand. So eliminating the decal going to a monthly collection fee, correct? Similar to like your water bill, is that what we were saying pretty much? Basically, like your water bill, there's a lot of details to be worked out. But Again, so, that's why it's taken us a year. Yes. But yes, we are looking at it being a user fee and being on a monthly bill. Certainly, the water bill would be one of the primaries. We will have to figure out some people that are not on water or sewer, but that's a part of the process. Some process, okay. And then the, the bulk trash, make sure I understand that. Is that going to be a one, one time monthly or just on the day you have your, like mine's on Wednesday? Right. It would be every Wednesday or once a month. I didn't quite it. That. It would be once a month once that you would month. get brush and bulk service. 
Um, so you would put it out whatever your assigned week and we'd have to create a calendar. There are other cities that actually create a calendar for the recyclables and their brush in bulk. They post it on their website. So we'd create a calendar and make that available. And so hopefully get people in uh, used to it. So for instance, Tuesday, you would be the second week of the month. You'd need to have your brush or bulk out by 7 a.m. And we second. would start at 7 a.m. combing that particular um, on that second Tuesday or something like that. Right, right exactly. Okay. So, yeah, and we so would spend that entire week in that area trying to clean it up so that the theory would be is once we clean it up, you don't put it out again for another month. So, is, so is, the neighborhood would, would So would there be like a penalty for a person that do do that or? We're going to have to work hard on that. It's going to be a lot of education. And, yes, I think we're going to have to consider as a part of the ordinance what the penalty would be if you – set out outside of your uh, assigned period. Um, again, you know, we did 38,000 residential violations and we've been able to manage that without a lot of complaints from what I understand. I haven't got a lot of complaints, so it's, it would be a matter of slowly educating and then ratcheting up enforcement. Uh, and then if we got to figure out how we're, what the penalty is going to be if you just absolutely refuse to comply. Okay. All right. Um, Let's, let's peace. Um, and also, you mentioned about using just one size can. Would be more um, as far as changing parts and just make it more consistent. Yeah, I think that would certainly it would uh, goes to back to the guiding principle of simple, not complex. Mm -hmm. um, again, giving citizens more. Uh, certainly, I, I would I would recommend not going to any more than two different kind of cans, and and at least maybe consider keeping a 64 and a 96 if that's what we want to consider. Um, I just think that again based on some data that we have that SCS collected it seems like people need more than what they've got and there is also some evidence in this um, report that talks about I believe it's about 20 percent of the people have two cans so that tells me that they need more than one so you know if if people are actually having two cans maybe one larger can would suffice okay. I do like the idea of the one can I do like the idea of of the monthly collection fee versus the decal, um, to me it's, it does seem to me more simpler, um, and also the bulk. Um, hopefully, I, would, I wish we could go to once a month. Hopefully, once we educate our persons and, and communicate the new pro that process that was decided upon, at least we we'll hopefully won't see it every week where you have trash um, out. Um, I don't, and I still don't understand what's happening on Gray Street. Um, if they're on a corner next to Guggenheimer, um, it is trash there almost the every time. week. I don't understand. Mm -hmm. Who, oh, what's going on there? But that's one of the um, major issues. I mean, it just and it's coming to the city, come on that way. It's just always yeah. trash right there. Okay. And I, I agree that yeah. potentially that sounds like illegal, illegal dumping. And I will tell you that's very difficult, especially if it's bulk. Mm -hmm. There's not going to be any evidence for somebody. Usually, we will dig through trash and find addresses if we need to. It's part of the enforcement process. But if it's bulk items, it's going to be really hard to find out who's placing those there. Councilmember Nelson, thank you. Council thank you, Madam Mayor. Ms. Hart, thank you for your presentation and all the work you and staff have done to, to identify the problems and come up with some solutions. And I also appreciate the consultant's uh, recommendations. Uh, two things. One, a comment. You know, with regard to brush and bulk, it's interesting to me that what is being proposed is what we used to do. It was either a call in or it was a des designated day in usually just quarterly, not monthly. And uh, it was the city that initiated the change to what we have now. So um, I guess some reflection shows that uh, we weren't so bad in, at all in the past. Um, the second point is there's a lot of moving parts to this. There's a lot to discuss and it, it needs to be done by council uh, more than on one just, just one work session. Uh, w if there's any issue that excites the emotion and passions of our citizens in addition to dogs and leaf pickup it's it's trash right and where in the schedule is it proposed that we have a public hearing on this after we formulate and have some more solid information to disseminate to the public that they can directly and concretely comment on or early on when we're trying to decide what the citizen sentiment is? Well, what do you know? 
I, we have talked about it briefly with Joanne Martin, knowing we were going to need to get some public, uh, some public input on this. Um, certainly there's going to be some in the, in the FY 2021 budget. That might not be the appropriate time to talk about that because right. as we have difficult budget discussions already, certainly I think that's something I can talk with Joanne about and maybe we could schedule something after the first of the year prior to uh, potentially actually getting in the budget deliberations. So that might be a potential thought process there. Okay, well, in order for the public to coherently comment, there needs to be some fairly specific identified uh, plan of action that they can internalize, assess, and provide their insights. And until we have that, which is going to take some time, I'm not sure a public hearing is all that worthwhile, but it has to happen. And I thank you. Council Member Helgelson. And I and I agree as Councilmember Nelson said this last time when the when the the rate went up 37 and a half percent as stated in the presentation, most people didn't even know about that. And I, and I granted I realized it was in there, but it's it's in lots of other things. You know, it's the time of the budget and uh, right after when people got the increase is when when I heard from them. Um, you know, but stepping back from this and I realize all the little, the minutia and the moving parts and and I look back over the years and I look back a long time ago when that was a city service you know there wasn't the decals and and I look back and you think about it we've gone through lots of iterations and lots of little changes and response for this and for that and thinking this will help and that'll do better and and I look back on that time and I think that we've gotten as as I think as Councilmember Wilder said we've gotten in some cases dirtier I mean, there's more trash that's on the sides that used to not be there. And I, I remember looking at a house one time, a long time ago, when the trash tags were first implemented. There was a house, there were renters, and they didn't want to pay for them. They took their trash bags and threw them in the gar in their garage. They were renting this house. I looked at, and there, I mean, it was bags of trash in the garage up to the ceiling. I mean, it's like, ugh. And, and And so, granted, most people don't do that, but somebody who's a renter that is you know, ain't gonna spend more money on these, these decals and, and trash tags at the time. And, and so lots of things that happened, little nuances, and this is nuances and more fees and, and whatnot, um, but if there's a way that we can go back and having that major goal of making sure Lynchburg is clean, that is what I wanna see. And so with that, lots of these things are if we now have to wait, like uh, as, as Sterling said about on Gray Street and Park Avenue, I've been up and down these places, uh, Carroll Avenue, there's stuff all the time. And if that stuff is gonna sit out for now a month, rather than the guy coming by with the little GPS system in his phone that says, hey, we got a problem here, and then they schedule it and come pick it up within a week or something, that's gonna get worse. I mean, when you have these, these bulk pickups that now go a whole month sitting out there on, on Gray Street. And I realize the problems with it, that there's, I mean, we're not dealing with somebody that's just, you know, gonna follow the, the law or whatever it is. Because I remember that one time not long ago, you went and picked up, I called somebody, a neighbor called me and they picked, you guys came and fabulously picked up that stuff. And within two days, there was just as much stuff on that corner. There's sofas and, and it's like, where in the world are you getting this stuff? I mean, it's, a lot of stuff to be to put there, piles of clothes, and you know, it, it's. Uh, I really hope that we'll kind of sit back and recognize the goal is making sure, you know, as our vision is that we want Lynchburg to be a great place to live, work, and play, and living means it's clean. And I, you know, I've had people that have called that, again, you know, they say some places have, have gotten really bad and embarrassed, you know. So, I think our main goal needs to be making sure we can do whatever we can to, to make things clean. And that means if maybe a truck comes by, we pick up that stuff and, and figure out a way that it's, uh, I can appreciate the concept of the utility uh, and a utility and enterprise fund, but I don't know if that's the same concept uh, because it's vastly different in practice than theory. I mean, we can talk about the, it's a enterprise fund and you know, in theory, 
But in practice, when people throw out a bunch of junk on the side of the street and you drive by there, that's bad for your neighborhood, it's bad for the city, it's bad for property values. Um, so I think we need to do a little bit more than just a little slight modification, so. Council Member Perro, thank you. Council Member Hagelson. Thank you, Madam Mayor. Um, I just had a thought while Council Member Hagelson was speaking about the uh, the ball trash pickup it's possible that we can do uh, both somewhat simultaneously if you set your trash out on the proper time and the proper and the proper month and the proper cycle you get your trash you get your bulk trash picked up if you don't you get you know it gets gps anyway probably so that uh, we know where that trash is so that you can help route your your bulk trash teams but uh, if you're outside the cycle then you get charged a pretty pretty significant amount for that special pickup that you just ordered um, so that could be a, a way to kind of merge the two and effectively um, disincentivize people from putting their trash out, except when they're getting it as part of their usual service. Um, speaking of that, I think one of the big, one of the decisions we need to make, and I completely agree with Councilmember Nelson, this is probably too much of, a, of an item to decide this evening. I think it needs to come back at a work session so we can go through uh, point by point. But one of the debates the council needs to have is, is trash collection a public service or is it a utility? Is it something that is paid for out of the general fund that is subsidized by fees or is it a utility that's paid strictly by, by fees? Um, I think that's something that uh, was clear in the presentation and, and a point that, that we need to understand and, and decide which, because that's gonna focus our discussions. Um, like Council Member Hegelson said, I've had uh, numerous, well, Ward 4 is, has a significant number of senior citizens in it. And I've had people tell me that they put their trash out, they buy their trash bag now. It used to be their trash tag and they get one a month for their smallest can of medicinal and they put their trash out once a month because they just didn't need it. So I can just hear people saying, what is this government waste that you're, you know, you give me this big trash can and you're gonna pick it up every every time. I don't need that. Why are you providing the service to me that I don't need? You're, you're spending too much. So I'm anticipating that argument coming along. Um, also, uh, one of the reasons we did the trash decal and the trash bag was to incentivize saving airspace in the landfill, that people would not feel the urge to, to fill up, or they'd be more conscientious about how much trash that they actually threw away, and would hopefully push to recycle a little bit. Uh, we're taking away that incentive, incentive now, um, and what is that going to do? do or are, are our loads gonna start increasing because people have a bigger receptacle to fill up? So I'm concerned about that as well. I think it warrants some additional discussion. Um, the the operational considerations that you have and the recommendations i've got i think those are wonderful great i think the moving to a monthly billing system makes a lot of sense i think it has to I, even I, we've had lots of discussions about um utility bills and how how they, how we collect utility bills and who utility bills are sent to i think it makes all the sense in the world though to to attach it to a water bill because that way you can enforce it as mr Irwin has told us that you apply all the fees before you apply the utility bill, it actually allows compliance. It's also one bill as opposed to another separate mailing that goes out. Unless we do it on a quarterly basis and it goes out with the real estate taxes and then that begs the question, can you put it into escrow with, um, you know, with any home mortgages? Uh, so those are the types of things that I'm thinking about. Um, but like I said, operationally, I like the changes that you're proposing and how to make this more efficient. I think we'll need to do that. Um, and then the rest, of my, the rest of my comments are really further along, or is this a utility or is this a, is this a public service? Because then that looks at the way you structure the fees and how you make it work. So I'm gonna save that for a future conversation if council's not opposed, or I'll keep talking for another 20 minutes. Yeah, I thought so, thanks. <laughs> Thank you. Um, thank you, everyone, for your presentation. Thank you, SCC, SCS, I'm sorry, uh, for your work that you've done. Um, and thank you, council members, for the discussion and Ms. Hart for the presentation. Um, because 
I know for us, for me, the past year, this has been a big issue. And um, thank you for the suggestions of how the billing and the carts and everything. I'm not going to um, repeat what has been said, um, except for I agree with Councilmember Haggleson on this trash bulk what's happening in these neighborhoods. And so what I'm hearing is that, okay, if, you know, I suggested that maybe landlords, you know, were doing better because we were monitoring in and watching in and putting in something on that part of it. Now, if we're saying that, okay, it's illegal dumping because I see like Councilmember Wilder and others that certain things you come by, you've picked it up and then it's immediate a couch, it's immediate a mattress, it's immediate a toilet. And so, uh, I don't like the idea that we can't do anything. I know a neighboring locality, they went through trash and there were charges brought. So I'm just thinking, because they're not just illegally dumping all over the city. Like there, it's specifically to certain corridors that I don't know if it's a plan that they, you know, figure people would not care about where it's being dumped or something. But I would like to know that in lo other localities, have there been strategies to deal with that type of illegal dumping? I don't, you know, we're not a, a city of cameras all over the place or anything, but I know that that has been used maybe before. So I just like to know are there other strategies that people use to help with this? And if it is somebody coming through all, you know, all the time, then that is a, that's a priority to me of putting some investment on that because, yeah, to wait, I, I'm, I can only believe that it's gonna get worse. I agree with the council member Hegelson on that. Yeah, and we do, just to understand, we do dig through trash when there's things like mail, it's ha household refuse, it's when it's sofas and that kind of thing. Right. We really cannot identify uh, those folks, so. Right. I agree, we, that is, that was almost, that, that's one of my main focuses is trying to correct this brush and bolt problem and quite frankly, to go to the monthly billing process. We've mm -hmm. got to get away from these decals. It's staff, it's just very labor intensive and, and it's ripe for errors when you've got that many um, moving parts, so. Right. And the, the brush, I don't think is, you know, it right. isn't the problem, it's, not it's the, problem. the bulk. Mm -mm. Because the bulk, I mean, you typically don't have vermin and rats and stuff and brush that's cut and thrown by the street. It's all that junk, I mean, that's what's, All right, thank you. Thank you very much for the presentation. And we just, thank you. I was about to say, we look forward to it coming back uh, to us. So thank you. Next is, <laughs> yay. <laughs> Woo <-hoo. laughs> Even though I really use a snow cone because it's like oh, oh I'm watching that and thinking how snow cones are nice and delicious and smooth. I ain't gonna touch one of them. <laughs> Thank you all very much. You've made it all right, <laughs> thank you. Next is consideration of approving a resolution confirming the city's commitment to fund the city's share of various transportation projects funded in partnership with the Virginia Department of Transportation and authorize the city manager to execute agreements on the city's behalf. Mr. Newland will give us this presentation. Yes, Madam Mayor, mm -hmm. Vice Mayor, members of council. Um, the city collects funds, or collects, we, we receive funds from VDOT um, for transportation projects. And almost every one we have to do a specific resolution for our part or our share of the um, funds if there are any. Um, VDOT has come to me and asked if we could do a blanket resolution where we would not have to be, um, not have to come back for specific resolutions on everything, and it would be for the projects, you know, if we've already applied for them, we already come to council for um, resolutions on them. This mainly happens, I can give you an exa a good example, is the State of Good Repair Funds, which is 100% funding from VDOT. Um, even though it's 100% funding, they still want a resolution that says, if we go over their 100% funding, we will take care of our share of the funding. So this is kind of a process that would keep us from having to come back every state of good repair project to get a specific resolution, we would have this blanket resolution. All right, thank you for that. 
Any questions? May I have a motion? I think oh. I have a question yes. For Walter. Mm -hmm. um, you know, and I realize this is different. We're a city. You know, the, the, the federal government and the Constitution in Congress, you know, where the legislative body acts, there's really a duty not to delegate. Um, and so this is kind of saying, hey, we're going to delegate that as a blanket um, without having specific items on here. Um, help me rectify that in my mind. Well, there's certainly uh, non-delegable duties that council can delegate to somebody else. One of them is making zoning decisions. You couldn't set up a commission or a body to make zoning decisions. Um, you know, there in this, they're asking council's approval. They're just saying, we don't want to have to come back every time. We want council to um, give us a broader approval than having to come back for every specific project. I'm not aware of anything that would prohibit that because council is still stepping in. It's still making a decision. It's just simply saying, we are agreeing that we don't need to do each one. We will give more author authorization. Um, so if council feels comfortable doing that, I think council can. Uh, again, I don't think there's anything that says this is a non-delegable duty that can't be done in this matter. It, it, so there's on here, there's no like specifics, uh, Mr. Newland. Or w which ones are you referring to? I'm, you know, I'm just I'm I'm fearful, especially when we've had uh, recently. I mean, there's been some things which I'm so thankful that got moved. We had a six million dollar. Uh, uh, an award from the state that was going to be in a roundabout off of River Mont Terrace. All the citizens are so delighted that that got moved to 501-221 interchange, fixing something that had massive needs for utility as opposed to a few drivers on there. And so, um, you know, it's kind of nice to see each one as they come about rather than just kind of a broad a stroke, um, especially when there's lots of ones that are in the works that are, I mean, I think somewhat controversial. I mean, one of these transportation, uh, we're, we're hoping to get some money, I think, for a sidewalk. Um, you know, there's lots of different things. So I don't know if I would uh, be in favor of just having a broad, uh, a broad brush on this. Mm -hmm. Yes, Council Member Wright. So this does not necessarily remove, well, maybe it does. The city's appropriate, the council's appropriation authority at the outset of a project. So, does this then delegate authority to you to decide what projects to enter into and the funding schemes, provided that there is a match from the state? Or would it still come to us for initial approval and then any actions after the project has begun? Well, what's the extent? I don't understand the parameters of this. And, and I understand. The, this came about, like I said, from the state of good repair, which is 100% funding. And it was for any amounts that went over, like if, if we, if, if the funding, which is a million dollars that we got this last time on state of good repair, and we went out there and because of, um, we needed to install cameras because we were taking out the loops that we didn't encounter that in the process, that was an additional $13,000. So since that was over the amount, we're basically saying that the city would be able to come up with their $13,000. Another example was when VDOT was putting in the bridge on Candler's Mountain Road over the railroad, they were paving back to the intersection of Candler's Mountain and Mayflower Drive, which was their road, they were paving that, and when they turned the radius into Mayflower Drive, there was about 250 feet of pavement that was failing, falling apart, and they asked us if, if we wanted them while they were there to do the paving and pay that small is that section. The, is that within the, the original appropriation or? It, 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 it wasn't an appropriation for the city at all. They were working on their road. There was a short 250 foot section that needed to be repaved and while they were there they came to the city. At that time it was a public works director, Dave Owen, and said, hey, we really want to pave this to make the project complete. It's 250 feet will y'all pay for that? We had money in our paving program. We said, yes, we would. And they turn around and says, oh, well, now we need a resolution from council saying that you'll pay that, that 250 feet. So I can assure you if this um, delegation of authority is, 
is given, the city manager isn't going to fund, isn't going to sign anything unless the funds are available. And that is something that could not be delegated. Council has to appropriate funds. So we're, um, the, what you're basically saying, if is council has appropriated funds for a project, then these funds could be spent for those projects. But if you got in a situation where the funds hadn't been appropriated, weren't available and needed to be appropriated, it would have to come back for city council for an appropriation. It's theoretically, it, this could be um, any any dollar amount. It, it, we're not talking necessarily about nominal amounts. This, theor again, theor if taken to the extremity and not sort of discussing the integrity of the folks who are overseeing these programs, but as a, as a, as a matter of, of what the resolution confers, it could be a sizable amount. It could be several million, for example, that could be authorized without council say so. Or am I, am I wrong? If, I mean, the city manager is one that signs it, and it, she just said if the funds were available or if they were appropriated. Hmm. It sounds like there could be legitimate things. And have we ever had a problem that it's like you couldn't pave that extra 250 feet? You know, you, you pave it. I mean, we've done this a few times where there's been, uh, you know, you did the paving because it happened to be right there. And then you come back and say, oh, by the way, we, we should have done this ahead of time, but it was kind of an emergency. I mean, yeah, I understand that completely. I think we've done that numerous times in grant applications where, uh, you know, you needed to get it done within three days because it was something new that popped up. And, uh, but to do it pro prospectively, I think that's, that's just where I'm having heart burn. Council Member Nelson. Uh -huh. uh, I'm now getting into wordsmithing. I understand the problem. I don't know that it has ever been a problem except for the state wants this to be approved, passed. But based on what the city manager has said, at least with this administration, that authorization is not going to occur unless available funds have been identified that can fund the extra. Can we insert in the resolution just that qualification that the, the city manager or his or her designee is authorized to execute all city state agreements and documents that be needed for any approved projects and so forth if he or she have identified available funds. Provided funds have been appropriated by city council. Appropriated and available. Then it's pretty locked in, I think. Okay, I, I would move that we pass a resolution with that amendment to it. All right, the motion has been made and second. Any further discussion from either Council Member Nelson or, oh, I'm sorry, Council Member Wright? All right, Council Member Perro, thank uh, you. Thank you, I think that's a good suggestion. Um, I was going to offer something similar to that where it be uh, pull out several items. So I think it's very valuable for us to see uh, revenue sharing. I think it's very valuable for us to see uh, the smart scale applications and I don't want this resolution to supersede those processes. So I see you shaking your head, but it reads like it does. It, it, um, is there any is there any sort of uh, indication that says that this is for uh, operational expenses versus capital expenses? Uh, when you said that you know, you're paving the additional 250 feet, that was a, that, I guess that paving is, state of good repair is a capital reimbursement, isn't it? Or is that an expense? It's a capital reimbursement. Nah, so that doesn't work. Um, you have a thought? Or, uh, I, uh, I think by requiring the city manager or designee to specifically identify a source allows them to identify whether it's operational or capital. As long as we, there is a source of funding, then the checklist is on the city manager to make that test. And so you'd still come to council with, for, for instance, the, uh, the revenue sharing projects and the list of revenue sharing projects, and this, this resolution would not supersede that. They require a specific resolution okay. stating those projects for okay. the okay. applications. Okay. Yes. But, but sometimes we have these, they're in bulk. You know, they're kind of like in the CIP or something that we do lots of things at once, but we're not necessarily um, 
have we ever had an issue with this where we needed something really quickly that we weren't able to do? That this would have solved the world's problems? Well, it's, uh, yeah, it, it, it's about a two-month process to get through city council. Uh, you know, oh, on these things? Yeah. And they've got the paving crew out there. On yeah, no, I understand go. that. And how can we expedite that? I mean, why does that take so long? I mean, if it's there, if, we're, if this blanket resolution would cover everything, how can we not just get it done rather than taking two, two months, just, I mean, we, we normally have advertising that can be, uh, it's already allocated, if the, so it's on the appropriation, so you don't have that requirement for the appropriation. If we have something on the agenda yeah, you've that's- already appropriated and it's part of the yeah. budget process, so. Yeah, but this, so if we appropriated the money, it shouldn't be a two month process, it should be something to throw on the agenda as a- is that what I heard? So there, there might be instances where right. they might want it more quickly. Correct. Correct. But, but I mean, could, could if, if there was a case, you know, rather than being a two-month process, I mean, if there's something that that Mr. Newland discovers by Tuesday, you put it on the agenda by Wednesday. It goes out on Thursday, yeah. and we're deciding it on Tuesday. I mean, that's not a two. I mean, two month. I completely understand, but. A, five days is uh... one thing that compelled me to approve the, or endorse this with that qualification is the accusation that had been made in the context of the airport authority discussions that we are not nimble we are embedded with procedures and bureaucracy that takes a long time we cannot make nimble and flexible decisions and I think this is a good example of where that might surface in these kind of contracts. So here, here, here are your little words again. I'm sorry if you, if you don't mind. Not your little words. Um, I mean the, the words that you, uh, you yeah, added on there. Words. Uh, the short words. It, at, the, at the end of the resolution, it shall continue in that same sentence if, fun, uh, if funds are identified to be available and for the previously appropriated pre by city council. Right. Provided funds have been previously appropriated by city council. That's so, acceptable. so the burden the burden is on city manager to make sure. It's a project that's been approved. Like Mr. Newland stated, if there's an extra 250 feet to pave, no problem with that. I'm just was just a little fearful of having some new kind of thing. So. Yes. I'm sorry. Any further questions? Thank you. Please vote. Seven to zero, and the motion passes. Thank you, Mr. Newland. Next is consideration of adopting an ordinance to regulate the use of shared mobility devices, such as electric power assisted scooters, skateboards, bicycles, etc., within the city. And this will be Mr. Irwin presenting this to us. Thank you. Just a follow up on something Councilmember Nelson said at the um, uh, last item. And he's exactly right. Uh, local government isn't designed to be quick and nimble. That's just the reality. Government is designed to be deliberative and, and measured. So yes, we can't get things done as quickly as sometimes we would otherwise like, but that's just one of the restrictions that is, is, you know, is placed on government. Um, this, this subject is, um, in recent years, localities have uh, been faced with an influx of so-called shared mobility devices, such things as electric scooters, electric bicycles, even electric skateboards. Um, and these devices provide citizens with uh, quick and cheap means of transportation, uh, but they're also causing a lot of headaches for localities. Uh, mobility delight devices are being haphazardly placed in the public rights of way. Uh, there have been a lot of confrontations between people using these devices and pedestrians, even a number of traffic accidents. And because the companies that provide these devices, their general operating practices, they simply set them out. They don't come to the locality. They don't notify the locality of what they're doing. Just one day, they're suddenly there. So. Earlier this year, the General Assembly adopted legislation that authorizes localities to adopt ordinances requiring companies that want to put out these devices in the public rights of way to get a permit from the locality. Um, 
However, given the wording of the legislation, if a locality doesn't have an ordinance in place by the end of the year, it loses the right to require the company to get a permit. The company can place these after the first of the year. If there's no ordinance in place, the companies that uh, put out these devices can do so without needing to get permission of the, the lo locality. So a number of localities that have dealt with these or are facing problems with these uh, devices have adopted localities. They're mentioned in the council report, Arlington, Blacksburg, Charlottesville, Fairfax, Richmond, Virginia Beach. Um, Lynchburg really hasn't had a problem with these devices being put out in the public right of way, but they are on the Liberty University campus. And we have had a, some correspondence from one of the companies saying that they'd like to at some point in the future come in and talk to the city about putting the devices out in the public rights of way. So um, in order to make sure the city is covered, that it has the authority to have an ordinance in place, uh, this ordinance is being proposed. It needs to be, it would need to be adopted before the end of the year. Uh, just want to emphasize that what you're seeing tonight is not uh, planned to be the final ordinance. This is something to be in place so that the city will have an ordinance on the books by January 1st. When the shared mobility companies show up, if they do show up in Lynchburg, at that point, we can sit down, talk to them. We can make changes in our ordinance to adjust it so it meets uh, Lynchburg's, the needs of the Lynchburg you know, community. Uh, the proposed ordinance uh, contains a number of provisions that are in the ordinances that have been adopted by other localities. Uh, but this ordinance is not as extensive as the ordinance that have been adopted by places like Charlottesville, Richmond, or Virginia Beach. It is a more uh, modest, I will say, version of the ordinance. It's similar to the ordinance that was recently adopted in the town of Blacksburg. Um, and while the ordinance contains a number of provisions that are in the ordinances that have been adopted by locality, other localities, uh, council might feel that some of these provisions aren't needed. For example, there's a data sharing provision in the ordinance that says, you know, the, the companies have to give the city general information, not in, uh, information about uh, specific identifiable users, but general information about the number of devices they put out in the community, uh, wh which areas of the city citizens are using those devices. So the city will have a, the statistics to know what's going on in the community. But if council would decide, well, we don't need that information, certainly that's not something that has to be included in the ordinance. I, I will say, I've seen that data sharing provision in every other ordinance I've seen that has been adopted by another locality, uh, but that isn't something that the city would have to do. So, uh, you know, once again, I just want to emphasize that while this is an ordinance to get on the books, so we'll have something in place before the end of the year, it's not intended to be the final ordinance. It's a preliminary ordinance. It's an ordinance that can be amended in the future. And I think we would anticipate that it would be amended to address, the, once the, if these devices do show up in Lynchburg, to address the special needs that Lynchburg might have. Thank you. Councilmember Wright. Thank you. Uh, just a couple questions. Um, first, uh, Mr. Irwin, are you looking for us to, um, are you looking for input this evening, ratification? What are you, um, what are well, you hoping for? It's on the agenda f to, for action. If to council vote. isn't ready to, to adopt it tonight, it. it doesn't have to, but that means then our, we will have to adopt, if we want an ordinance, we'll have to adopt it at the December meeting because it has to be adopted by the end of the year mm -hmm. if we want to protect our right to require these companies to get permits from the city before putting their devices out. Mm -hmm. um, Okay, uh, so I'll just share some of my concerns with the, with the proposed ordinance. Um, so section 1055-9D uh, has to do with uh, using, um, using these devices while either um, under the influence or while texting. Um, and although it says in the ordinance that these are, I think, strongly discouraged, um, it strikes me as um, something that, that if we are legally permitted to do so, we might want to prohibit. I, the idea of folks riding around drunk on scooters in downtown Lynchburg, given all of our hills, strikes me as being particularly dangerous and not something 
um, that we would even want to say strong, that we strongly discourage, but rather prohibit. So, um, and Mr. Irwin did re reply back to um, my note on that, and I don't know if you perhaps wanted to sort of share what we are permitted to do by, by state law. Okay. You know, this is an area where the law hasn't quite kept up with technology. So at this time, um, these, uh, these offenses, texting while operating motor vehicles while uh, under the influence or texting is a violation of state law. Riding these devices and doing those things isn't a violation of state law. So any time there's no law on the books at this point, there may be in the future, but it isn't addressed by the state code at this time. So any time a locality does something that um, isn't specifically authorized by state law, you always run the risk that you'll be challenged as you're violating the Dillon rule. You're doing something that the state hasn't authorized you to do. On the other hand, Lynchburg has a very broad provision in its city charter that says just like the state, the city has the authority to pass all ordinance that it deems necessary for the public health and safety. So I think the city could, while it might be reaching a bit, could say that uh, we think that charter provision gives us the authority to prohibit these activities in order to protect the public health and safety, even though it's not specifically authorized by state law. I don't think you know, that would clearly be a breach of going too, too far. Mm. Um, so I, I sort of raise that as a concern for discussion, something I'm, I'm a little bit uncomfortable with. And then uh, uh, I think it's the, the item that, that Mr. Irwin mentioned about uh, GPS tracking data being shared with uh, the city. Um, so I'm just sort of curious to hear more about what the policy implications of that kind of data collection uh, would be what kind of insights we're hoping to glean. Um, because otherwise, it strikes me that even that, that, that data, which presumably would be metadata and anonymized, might still yield conclusions that would be particularly intimate for people in the community. And I'm not really sure the city wants to be in the business of collecting that kind of data, which could actually probably be identifiable. So for example, it's conceivable where you could see one person get a scooter at this like one block in downtown and then be scootering back and forth between these two places, you might be very well able to pinpoint exactly who that person is if they live in that building and where they're going to visit. So I, I'm just sort of concerned about whatever the privacy implications of that kind of data collection uh, the, might be. Well, the, and I don't think the reports that would be, don't think the reports that would be provided to the city would be that level of detail. The, Right, because the ordinance says we respect the rights of the company to keep all their uh, confidential data confidential. What the city would be looking for, a report saying this is how many scooters this particular company has placed in Lynchburg. These are the locations where those scooters have been located. Um, these are the areas of the city where scooters are being the most used. It would be that general information, not individual information that would allow people to, to, well, to allow the city to identify individuals. Now, I do have to say the fact that you use the apps on your cell phone to use these devices that the police department could get search warrants and have access to the phone records and probably could be able to and identify which individual, but that was using a device in a particular area. But that information certainly wouldn't come from the reports to the city. That would be the type of information that the police department can use on, gather on all of us to track our cell phones. If they want to know if, if we, we are suspected of a crime, they can get a search warrant to determine if our cell phones show that we were in a particular area of the city when a crime was, was committed. But that isn't the type of individual information the city would be looking for. The city would be looking for the general information. Mr. Owen, it says GPS tracking data for every trip route, which is there a legal standard for what GPS tracking data means then for every trip route? I have to tell you a lot of these terms are still being worked out and, and fought over. So I would say at this point there probably is no general term as to what that would mean. So that could, in fact, to, incorporate a lot of things. To some extent, the city would have to define those terms when it would ask the company for the report. It'd have to say, this is what we would like you to include in the report. Okay. Thank you. All right. Thank you. Council Member Nelson. Thank you, Madam Mayor. 
uh, I know this is not a final form, so therefore to debate and discuss it tonight is somewhat uh, fruitless. But the General Assembly has provided the city and all localities with the opportunity to protect themselves and their citizens before the first of the year. And if we don't act, then there's going to be a limitation on uh, someone who gets hurt and wants to hold the manufacturer liable is probably going to have a difficult time doing that. So in my opinion, to protect and protect our citizens and their interests, uh, I am in favor of, a mo of the city and authorizing city staff to craft a document that is consistent with the enabling legislation that the General Assembly has put in this format and presented to us for consideration and approval before the first of the year. And obviously that needs to be in the first of December. You know, I would have to say we'll need some staff, will need a lot of some guidance from council to do that. All the legislation says is that localities can adopt an ordinance regulating these devices and that if your <laughs> ordinance isn't on the books by the end, by the beginning of the year, you lose your right to do so. It, it doesn't give the localities any guidance. The ordinance that is before you tonight has, is, is based on ordinances that have been adopted by other localities in the state, what they typically put in their ordinances, but then a number of the things that were in those ordinances you know, weren't included because we figured, well, gosh, Lynchburg probably doesn't need them. For example, um, Richmond, they're charging, if, if you're a company and you're gonna have between one and 100 scooters, you've got to pay them a $40,000 annual fee. That's uh, <laughs> if, if you're between 101 and 102 scooters, it goes up to 60,000, and between 201 and 500 scooters, it's 80,000. The city isn't proposing, unlike a number of other localities, we're not proposing to, to charge those fees. Uh, Virginia Beach, in their ordinance, they're banning the operation of these devices from the ocean front. They say, we don't want people using them down here again. We're not banning any areas of the city. Again, ours is, again, when you look at some of these other ordinances, which are much more lengthy and much more detailed, ours is somewhat of a bare bones ordinance. It's just, um, and it, if, if there are any parts of it, like the data sharing that our council uh, finds particularly offensive, those can be struck. But um, to bring something else back, you know, if we used other ordinance, well, I did most of the work, used the other ordinance as a guide, tried to keep it a modest ordinance, thought the Blacksburg ordinance was a better ordinance, wasn't as extensive as some of the ordinances from Charlottesville, Richmond, Virginia Beach, so thought this was a good starting point. But you know, we'll need specific guidance from council. If council says, we really don't like some of the stuff in here, you know, I need council to tell me what they do and don't like to, to know how to revise the ordinance to, to bring it back in December. Do we have time on our docket and work session in December to address it that afternoon and then approve or disapprove it that night? Yes, certainly. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, and consistent. The item that is on the work session agenda for December 10th is a discussion regarding R1 zoning. Um, and the audit report, which should not take very long. Mm -hmm. So there's room on that agenda. I think Council I Member say. Wright has made some good comments that I know I would agree with in terms of editing this, but there would be and probably will be others that we can communicate to City Attorney between now and then. Mm -hmm. All right, Council Member Perro and then Hazelson. I, I would endorse that. I think it's important that the city preserve their right to regulate this. I, I'm, you know, we can cut it back. I think uh, I appreciate what you've done to make more of a modest approach to it. I in favor be, I would like to strike section 11 for the, for the data gathering. Um, at a, if, if the city argues successfully that they need some of this data, then at the very minimum, it should be an annual report on a month, on a monthly 
basis, I guess. Well, I think if we adopt the ordinance, adopt an ordinance, as long as we have something on the books, again, this is not intended to be the final ordinance. Understood. We can revise it in the future, and if they would come to the city and say, for example, mm -hmm. we need this data in order to help the police department or the traffic enforcement people deal with these devices, we could put it in at that time. It doesn't have to be in this version right we just have to have some ordinance on the books right. and that ordinance can be tweaked in the future right and but there's no point in collecting data if it's not going to be used otherwise yeah. it's just going to sit on somebody's desk so i think we just strike that um i also think we need to be specific there's a term in there that I was not familiar with until i talked to uh, uh the city manager that's i think it was geolocating no it's 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 geofencing, yeah. which, Geo is, which is which it, it, stuff like that and needs to be identified as to so lay people like me knows mm -hmm. what is it. Mm -hmm. um, also, I think there's some collateral damage. I think our, our, we should really strive to do no harm in doing this. And uh, collaterally, this affects the business, the bike rental business down on the river. Um, by definition, the, it, by in the first paragraph, it talks about bicycle or electric power assisted bicycles, docked or dockless. Um, and it is a sharing system because it's a, it's a rental system. And I, I saw another place where, where that we need to make sure that we're not uh, putting an undue burden on the existing rental businesses that we have. So if there's a way to clarify that when it comes back, I think that'd be important. Um, and I think those are the two major things that uh, I thought about in my review. But finally, it is important that we that that we preserve this this right. And I think we can go back, just like you said, and we can trim this thing, cut it down a bit. Oh, I think a business license requirement is is important as well, as long it, it, so that the providers comply with our existing business license uh, ordinances um, you know I think this type of service would fall within the general broad categories of business license they would be a service provider providing yep. transportation services but I can check with the commissioner of you know of okay. revenue but geofencing I, I saw some uh, uh, questions when that went up that is really neat technology that now you can program these devices for example the scooters that are on Liberty uh, University's campus they are supposed to be geo fenced which means you enter the technology so you can't take them off campus when they get to the campus boundaries they stop uh, the way other localities are using geo fencing mm -hmm. is um, like Virginia Beach where it prohibits the use of the devices in certain areas of the city <laughs> The devices have to be set up by the company, Geofence, so that the device will stop working if you try to take it into a prohibited area. Uh, geofencing can also be used if you set up designated parking spaces for the devices so they just won't be left everywhere. It automatically directs the device to the permitted designated parking spaces. So it is really, really cool, you know, technology. Oof. Helgelson, thank so, you. Uh, on your report here, it says, if the city wants to preserve its ability to license companies that provide this. So what, why would we want to preserve the ability to license this? I know we're getting kind of in the, in the minutia of, yes, we need it by the end of the year, but why do we want this ability to license right. this? What, what is the, the actual? Well, for, for example, I have two newspaper articles in Richmond, Bird Scooter, put out hundreds of these scooters, just dumped them on the city sidewalks. They didn't get permission from the city of Richmond. Uh, they didn't tell the city of Richmond what they were doing. They put them out in what the city considered a haphazard matter. And the city went around and confiscated them and said, you just can't put stuff on our property without telling us and put it out in an appropriate manner. Um, have another article where it says so if, so if we didn't have this, they could, they could do that they okay. could just put the scooters out without telling us Norfolk recently confiscated over 400 scooters because the company just dumped them throughout the city without uh, notifying the local officials or, or uh, telling them so yes if you if you don't adopt an ordinance the company's allowed to come in and put these devices in the public rights of way 
with, without having to get authorization from the locality or letting the locality know what they're doing. So with that, I think, so I, I can understand that. So with that, I think one thing we do need to have is a separation. Um, you know, these are on Liberty's campus. I'm probably the only one that's ridden them. They're a ball, by the way. Mm -hmm. Got the app, it's great. Oh man, they're fun. Um, very easy to do too, by the way. You, you hit the little app and it unlocks it and, and, and they're great. Um, with that, we do have on Liberty's campus, we have the institutional zoning, okay? The institutional zoning ordinance, I realize this is different, but we've kind of said with that institutional zoning that says on your campus, you know, in there, provided it's nothing that affects outside, you know, the traffic, and that's what you just mentioned about the geo uh, fencing, that these scooters don't work when you take them over to Hardee's or take them under the tunnel to Starbucks and whatnot. Um, so if we can craft it in a way that, that respects that institutional zoning. Yeah. Well, this ordinance doesn't impact scooters who are placed on private property. So this would not have any impact on Liberty. This ordinance is drafted to the placement the of scooters on outside. public property. Public property. So okay. this, the only way this would impact Liberty, well, this ordinance wouldn't impact Liberty at all. The e only thing even that some of the roads that are there. Well, no, are, the, the, this ordinance doesn't deal with that issue. Right now, what we do have is um, Liberty does have several public streets, yes. and right now the city code would pro prohibits the use of these type of devices, any device with runners, wheels, except for bicycles on the public streets. So if somebody is riding one of these scooters on the public streets in the Liberty campus, then they would be violating the city code. But this ordinance doesn't do anything at all about that. If we want to deal with that, we'll need to amend those sections of the city code that prohibit the use of such devices on the streets. And then that gets into the argument where should these be devices be allowed streets or the sidewalks you know or or both on the sidewalks you run the risk that they run into pedestrians if you get them on the streets then you run the risk that the scooters will be hit by motor vehicles and you'll have more serious accidents so there isn't really a good good answer and, and you realize there's not just the licensing of the companies because there's lots of these things that you can actually just go buy I mean, people have their own. So it's not a company, it's somebody buys them, like a skateboard that's electric. I mean, it can, it, it's not a, a rental from a company like Bird. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, Again, this ordinance is only to address the companies that place these things out in the public sidewalk. They don't deal with an individual who buys one and uses it. This is for the companies who place these things out for citizens to you know to use that's all the ordinance deals with doesn't deal with property private property doesn't deal with individual citizens who want to buy and use a device and so regarding the bicycles so is that just an electric bicycle or is that a regular bicycle no, this would cover a regular bicycle if the owner of the company that owns the bicycles that is making them available puts them out in the public right of way for someone to use. Again, if the bicycles are on private property and somebody goes and rents them from the company, this wouldn't apply. This share, this this ordinance wouldn't apply. What this ordinance would, would apply to an, an electric or a non-electric bicycle, if the owner of the bicycles is putting them out in the public right of way for shared use by citizens, then the ordinance would apply whether or not it is um, <coughs> you know, electric or not. And it might be council wants to limit it just to electric devices saying, we're not sure that just regular bicycles would be a problem. There are probably not that many, maybe not a lot of people who want to use them. Everybody wants to use the, the electric ones because they're much easier to get around. I, I guess so with that, if you're coming back with something, I would have, and, and especially if you said that, uh, you know, we can amend it later. I would walk as lightly as possible. I mean, because there's lots of things on here. Rather than getting on this, just have our ability to, uh, you know, to have the license. And then you don't have, I mean, yeah. I'm assuming you're not going to have all these different requirements. As, you know, as Councilmember Wright mentioned, you got 9, 10, the helmets, the data, the insurance, uh, 
Again, All those, those are recommended things. because at this point, there's no law that requires the people to use helmets. Um, the companies don't furnish helmets to go with the devices, but certainly the, it's interesting. Uh, uh, it, the, one of the exhibits that was attached to these materials at the local government attorney's uh, conference last month, one of the presentations was on e-scooters, um, and some of those slides were enclosed with materials. At the end of the month, at the National Risk Managers Conference, they had a similar presentation. And um, I'd have to say, you know, again, some statistics. Consumer Reports um, did a consumer report did a study that says, gosh, there have been uh, forget the precise figure that since these they started looking at these things in 2017, when they first started coming out, how many thousands of accidents there have been involving these devices. Uh, so with those so accidents, they, you know, we, they encourage everybody to use a helmet. Hmm? Well, so when accidents happen, just like a vehicle or a bicycle, there's nothing to do with the city, even if we license it, there doesn't bring us into somehow liability? Well, th that's something to be resolved. You know, if a citizen gets mowed down by one of these devices who's traveling on the sidewalk, they and may we say, we gave well, them a license. This is the city's fault because we allowed them to operate on the sidewalk. Um, but those are issues that localities are having to, to so deal with. So if we with. don't have a license on it, and they mow it down because they're riding it because they wanted to, then it's, it seems like by us l licensing something, no, the, 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 again, that doesn't have anything to, they're completely separate issues. The license just says if I'm a company and I want to put out my stuff on the city right of way, I have to get a permit from the city that tells the city where I'm going to put them, how many I'm going to put out. It's other ordinances that aren't part of this ordinance that deal with things like riding these devices on the sidewalk, riding these devices on the streets. I, I think that if these devices show up in Lynchburg, we're going to have to get with the police department, and we may need to have to amend all those other ordinances that talk about where these devices are allowed. But this device just says, you know, we want you to tell us what you're going to do before you put out these devices. We want you to encourage, even though you don't require it, users to use helmets. Um, we want you to, to do certain things to try to make it a safe experience for citizens because they're, uh, well, I know they're fun, but they're also pretty, the statistics bear out, they're pretty dangerous. Okay. But I will make the, I've heard the council's comments, I'll make revisions to the ordinance and send it out to council in advance so we'll have something that can be considered at the, at the next meeting. Okay, thank you. So no actions required. I don't know why I thought, I okay. All right, well thank you. Is there anything further? No discussion? We are adjourned. Have a great evening.